How everybody doing today? How, how's your week been? I mean, somebody um, and and I know we we made it to another Shabbat. So how was your how was your week? Anybody got anything they would like to share? I do more right. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Shabbat Shalom, Aki. I'm highly upset. I had to work on this day. I had to come in and make the donuts, unfortunately. But I'm here. I'm in the number. I, I hear you. I hear you. Babylon. Yeah, yeah. Babylonian system, man. Um, yeah, um, no worries, no worries. When, uh, when, what time do you think you're going to be out of there? Well, I'll be leaving in about 15, 20 minutes. But then oh. I got to come back later. But the thing is, I had to work. I'm, I'm upset. Hey, I hear you, man. Man. Yeah, um, I hear you on that. I'm uh, I got something special for us today. I'm gonna do something a little different. I don't know if we should do it before or after. I'm trying to think. I'm trying to think. Maybe we. Let me see. Let me see. I might switch it up and do it before, but uh, we'll see. I'm actually finishing it up in the background. Um. But anybody else? How was your week? I mean, what did you? How was that week this week? I mean, is it and also how's the weather? I know it is it is it raining where you are? Is it cold? What you got? It was a blessed week for me. It's it's rainy season here in, in uh where I am. <laughs> oh, in yeah. zombie, it's rainy season right now. But you know, I, I wanted to ask you a question about Shabbat. Like mm -hmm. different Moors have different takes on it. So um like for instance, could you go in and you know work in your garden on Shabbat? I mean, are are you supposed to just sit in the house and um? I just want a clarity, kind of like on. I do a lot of studying, reading, and watching different assemblies. But say you know I did that for a few hours, and then I wanted to go out and maybe um, prune some something is that okay or are we not supposed to because some people say it's just work that you make money from and that type of thing so how do you how do you see it more um so technically from from my understanding um it's no work on that day so um i i have heard people kind of justify i don't know i don't want to say justify but they have given me their understanding of some things but from my understanding of the text, um, it is not a day where we, you know, put aside things that we can get to that we didn't get to during the week, if you know what I mean. Um, and, and especially like pruning, you know, it would be that would be considered gardening. So that would be field work, technically. So it could fall in the category or it would. And from my understanding, it will fall in the category of, of laborious work, no matter how light it is. Like, I don't even tend to my garden on the Shabbat. Um, I don't do anything with it. Um, so that's my understanding of it. Like on that day, it's not, you don't sit in the house. Like you can go walking, you can go to the park with your family. You can do different things. It's not a day of dread, so to speak. Um, it's, it's not a day like that. It's just, it's a day to be, you know, honored and, and literally set apart from any other day. So there are certain things that I personally don't do on the Shabbat, right? Um, like I don't work out on the Shabbat. I've heard different things from different people um, where they actually, you know, they work out. I don't, I don't work out on the Shabbat um, because technically it's doing work. You're building, you're building your body. You're doing some type of work. Another thing is on this day, like there are some people that don't watch television unless it's something with the family or something like that or movies but they don't you know what i'm saying it's people got different ways they honor this day it's a day technically where we are literally supposed to kind of we're we're literally supposed to focus in on our relationship with the most high so uh but i'm not saying so with that said like if you're at a feast day you're at a gathering and a shabbat occurs um, there may be certain types of activities that people do together. There may be play activities, recreation, you know, things that are, that are where people are having fun, um, coming together on this day. 
Um, but anything that falls in the category of any kind of work or, um, you know, we know, fi- you know, we know financial gain work, obviously that's out. Um, but laborious work as well. Cause I think on that day, as well as the day of atonement, I don't have my scripture pulled up, not that scripture pulled up right now, but it's a certain, let me see, uh, See if we can go to Leviticus 23. I was trying, I was working on something in the background for us, but um, this one here, I just want to get verify something because here we go. All right. Okay, so in verse 20, verse 3, chapter 23, it says it is a complete rest. It says you must not do any work. So what I want to do is now look at the word for work in that verse. Um, 23.3. So the word here is Malachi. Right. Six days work shall be done. So the word for work in that first part is Malachi. This occupation is work business, uh, cattle, craftsmanship. Um, I would assume husbandry would be in that as well, gardening. Um, Now let's go to the other word in this verse. The Sabbath of solemn rest. Okay. Same word, Malachi. So it's saying, Six days you do this type of work. On the seventh day, you don't do this same type of work. So, and then if you look up the word, it looks like it's saying, um, I had to go to the lexicon. So, okay, work is done, something or done or made. So creative work. I know people, there are some people that don't do creative work on this day. Um, Occupational work, property work, uh, looks like it's saying in the Brown Drivers Briggs right here. Uh, workmanship, it says in every kind of workmanship, service use, public business, political. Uh, okay, so it's just, it's giving some different types of ways to see it. Now, oh, let me go to uh, Day of Atonement as well, because I want to see if there's a contrast with Day of Atonement and also feast day work. All right. So let's go to Pesach first. All right. Let's go to verse 8. Leviticus 23, verse 8. And uh, let's see what that says. Shabbat Shalom for those who just joined. We'll give people some time to come in. And I'm working on something for us in the background that I think we're going to do. We might do it in the beginning today. All right, verse 8 says, uh, yeah, a little something different. Okay. So this is talking about Pesach. You shall offer an offering made by fire to Yahuwah seven days. The seventh day shall be a holy convocation. Any customary work you shall not do. Then I'm summarizing how that's written. The word for work there is also Malachi. However, there is a word before that. Because this is not talking about work for the feast. So customary, the word they translate as customary is abodah. Now that work is talking about a service labor, bondage labor, construction, uh, like a job. Um, so it, it is defining this type of work as it's saying, it's specifying the type of work you can't do, yet it looks like it is saying work for the feast, you can do. Specific, it got to be directly related to the feast, though. From my understanding, it's got to be directly related to the feast, the work you do. Um, now, I want to I wanna go somewhere else because uh, something else came to my mind, which is Day of Atonement. So let's slide on down to verse... Uh, let's go 20, 
28. Let's try 28. It might be 29. Let me see if my guess was correct. Yep, 28. All right. So no work. So the word here is, it is also Malachi. It's written in a certain way, but it's it's uh it's Malachi and it's also low Malachi. So this is saying no work. Now it is repeated on this. I think it's repeated in Leviticus 28, 23. All right. So there's an affliction that occurs that we know. Um, we, we can understand that to be. Um, we've talked about that before. I think it's more than just fasting. Um, it is about a mindset of humility and bowing oneself down. Let me keep going because there's another way. There's another word here. Here we go. And any per verse 30, any person who does any work, the word again is Malachi. The word for any right here is call. So it's saying all, any kind of work on this day. It was saying that person will be, um, be destroyed from among his people. So these two days, let me go back up to the Sabbath one more time. Let's go back up to the verse 23. I mean, uh, three. Uh, here we go. So, it is saying, Lo Malachi for the Sabbath as well. Now, let me let somebody in the room. So, this is something we, we could dive into a little bit deeper. Um, but it does appear that it is saying, No work. Uh, for these specific days. Um, now, their feast work and things like that, that's a little different. But yeah, like, so for me personally, like, it's certain things I don't do at all on the Shabbat. Like I said, I don't work out. Somebody might say, well, hey, I'm going to just go, I'm going to go give me a run in because it, it helped me open my mind up and, and I can relax and hear the scriptures better. Uh, based on what I see in the scripture, I'm not sure if that's allowed, honestly. Not, I mean, because it's technically working out. Now, if you go on a walk with your family, you know, a sightseeing, go to the park, experience in nature, I perceive that as classified as different. Like I've taken, we've gone to the park before, you know what I'm saying? Like I've gone to the park before. Um, but as far as like, but it's for leisure, like I'm not going out there to work out. You know, I ain't, I ain't pack my stuff. I ain't going out there to give me a workout in, if you know what I mean. I ain't trying to sneak one in, so to speak. Because I'm classified it as going to the park, if you understand what I mean. So um, I think it's kind of, it, one has to follow his convictions, but it, all, it first and foremost, it's got to line up with the script. Me personally, I don't see, I don't know if that's allowed, the, the workout thing. I'm not sure if it is. I'm not quite sure on it. I don't perceive it is um, because it's a day of rest. But technically on that day, you're not resting. You actually got to work out in. So, but even though that person may say it helps them open their mind up, you know, to hear the scriptures better. I get that, but it looked like it's saying that, you know, on that day, just chill. Um, another thing is, I got it. Somebody asked a question about cooking on the Shabbat. I don't know if I ever answered that. I didn't answer that question. Somebody asked that. I guess we can answer that when we get into it, but so I could get into that a little bit later because I had, I got a, a, an explanation for that because it's something I used to teach that I no longer teach. And I actually um, want to wait till everybody get in so I can explain that because um, my understanding has grown. So uh, hopefully that's a long answer, Koti, that I just gave you. But I would say uh, a no-go on the gardening, <laughs> on the Shabbat. Okay, yeah, it just gets, um, I don't know, because there are some ways they say, you know, if you want to go to your child's, sports game or something like that that it would be okay and if you if so then if you can go to their sports game and watch them play then and i'm it's not something that that i want to do i'm in africa but say somebody wanted to go to a laker game what would be the difference between doing that mm -hmm. oh well you got to pay for it that's one thing unless you pay for the tickets ahead of time but do that yeah. or go to your kids game you know what i'm saying so it's like almost like where does it stop? Where does it start? You know, that type of thing. They say they're not saying sit in a chair and look at the wall, you know, but then, so it's like, okay, so you, where's the scripture? What does it say that, um, 
Shabbat is made for man or something like that. I mean, not, not man for the Shabbat. Yeah, then that's in Matthew. Yeah, I think Matthew. And then what? What is that saying? Is uh, so it is. I don't know. It's confusing. I don't know. No, no, I get what you're saying. Um, that scripture, from my understanding, is actually saying, you know, it, it is it is a day that's set aside, uh, you know, for for your rest. The Shabbat is a gift. Um, it, it's made for man, you know, in that regard. So it's the Most High is giving you a day and say, hey, listen, follow these instructions for this day. Chill, relax, let your body reset, let your mind reset. Um, even carry your conversation and your thoughts a certain way on this day, like totally unplug and this day helps you reset and um and it's a gift so it, that's the way i see that scripture saying it's a gift for man um so when it, also when you live we live in a system this is one thing we, we do have to understand as well we do live in a system that does not cater to the laws of the most high so we have to admit where this system has infringed upon our understanding and has influenced our understanding quite frankly, right? Because every a lot of stuff happened on Saturday, right? Um, I'm missing a game right now that my daughter's playing in, right now. However, there have been times where I have attended games um, where I did not conduct any business, but I was able to attend a, a game, right? So I celebrate the Shabbat from Friday sundown to Saturday sundown, right? Currently, from my based on my current understanding. So there have been times where I've attended a game where I have paid for and been inside the venue before sundown. And I did no business and left the venue after I watched my daughter play, didn't stay for the boys game and went back home or went back to where I was staying. Um, my daughter plays AAU basketball. So a lot of the parents on the team, they notice that I'm not there on Saturdays, right? Things of that regard. So, um, and, and it's one thing I'm trying to get an understanding of as well, because I know that's an issue that a lot of people are kind of trying to figure out what to do. What Do they put their children into sports? Do they do things of that regard? You understand what I mean? And this is my oldest daughter. So my oldest daughter is before I met my wife. So, uh, so she's living in two different households, if you understand what I mean. She's technically under my household, but she's living in two different places. So she lives with her mom. So in that regard, you know, I, I understand that dynamic as well. So in regard to just being there in the venue, making sure that I'm clean, I've done that. Where if, if it's been an opportunity where I could not do that, I don't attend. Because I can't, it's, it's, I, it's, I don't want to violate my, I don't want to violate the Shabbat, if you understand what I mean. And then, you know, that you have certain convictions in your, your conscience. Um, so I, just case in point, like I've been inside venues before where I've gotten there super early and they let me in the venue and I'm just sitting in there, you know, watching the teams warm up and, you know, different things go on. And, and then everybody else starts to file in later on, but I'm in there before the sun goes down. So once the sun goes down and, you know, my daughter's done, I leave the venue and I go and, uh, you know, continue. I go and keep the Shabbat or observe the Shabbat in the way the father's leading me. So it is a, it's a different dynamic and it really speaks to the point that we need our own stuff. I, I've talked to men about this. Like we need our own league because sports, I, I perceive this based on what the most I shown me. Um, sports can be beneficial. Like the most I use it in my life to build me as a man in various ways. You learn how to work with people because we, we learn how to, to reach a common goal with people. Like you, you learn how to, overcome you learn how to endure you train it's a lot that goes with it i use stuff that i learned in sports in the boardroom in the, in the corporate world if you understand what i mean um you know playing in front of large or or, or lots of people rather or dif different sized crowds um you learn and i was a pitcher at one point in my career so the pitcher is the center of attention so when I play baseball, so you, you understand what I mean? It's just, I know the most I can use, he can use whatever he chooses, he sees fit uh, to build you. And I perceive that sports is one of those things. So it's good to have our young men and our young women in those things that are righteous um, and also and do, doing them according to the most high as well. Let me say that as well. And 
Um, but we, but it speaks to the point that we need our own stuff too. And we know right now we don't have our own stuff. And I say it like this, cause I, I talked to one of my elders before they had a guy one time that I think was fellowshipping with them and he played for the bears. I think he was with the bears or something like that. So his contract required, required him to work on that day. So because of his position, I think the way it was told to me, he would donate the money he would make on that day. So that was his, he was in a position to do that. And that was his conviction. Um, his contract required him to do it. We know we got young men that play scholarship basketball and sports. Um, and they have signed a letter of intent, right? And they go to this college, they in this system, they go to this college and, and part of their getting paid for their school getting paid for is that they got to, you know, they, they are there as an athlete, technically, you know what I'm saying? Technically, you know, and, and it's, you know, that's another subject I want to get into, but they just now started to pay the boys, the young men and young women money through the NIL deal started a couple years ago or a few years ago, however long it was. But when I was in college, they didn't pay us. You got stipend money every now and then. Spring break came around. You might have had, you know, whoever guys had different financial situations, whether they got Pell Grant money, refund checks, things like that. Um, but technically, you weren't getting paid for NIL. You Some some sports, you can't even work. You can't work in the offseason. You can't work during the season. You know, so some guys have, you may have to make, and girls, young women have to make some tough decisions because they can't work, but they're getting their school paid for. So do they stay in school, keep playing sports, or do they leave? But that's another story. But we also know this, the other side of this is, is this. The most I can use whatever he sees fit. Yosef was in politics in Mitzrayim. He was second in command of Pharaoh. Daniel was a governor in Babylon. Matter of fact, it says Daniel was favored. He was the it was only it was three governors at the time Daniel was governor. He was and the, and the and he was like the most. And we know Daniel was a righteous man. And you know, being in Babylon, they had their own type of things that Babylon had their own way of 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 living it. They would impose on the people that were there. So we know we live in a system, right, that does not cater to the laws of the Most High. So what I always try to tell people to do is, if you have a conviction and you have this, and like like you bring up a good question, because I've had on the coach, he asked me about, you know, attending her son's, I think, band event. Uh, it was on Saturday, if I remember correctly. And, and me as a moray, because what I do is I direct a person right back to the Most High. I'm a, I'm a, I'm, the information I'm giving you, I might give that out in one of our conversations to help you when you go pray. But technically, your answer is going to come from the most high. You're going to get a conviction. Like when I've attended these games on like a Shabbat, I have prayed about these situations. This ain't something like, you know, that I just randomly do. Like I said, I'm missing a game right now as we speak. Game is going on right now. So um, there have been times where I know once we were out of town, and I pray about these these times when I do go. We were out of town one time for a tournament. Her mom, my oldest daughter's mom, was not there. So my daughter had no, technically no supervision uh, for the first game. I remember it was the first game. It was actually before a Shabbat gathering. And the game was very early in the morning. It was like 8 o'clock on a Shabbat. And so what I did was, when you go to some of these tournaments, you can purchase what they call like an armband where you just pay for the whole weekend. Whether you're going to be there or not, you just pay for all the games. So I did that. Pay for all the games, recognizing that that, that Boker that I had to take her because I, I wasn't going to, I needed to be with my daughter at this time. And I was like, and I felt led to, I didn't mean, I didn't want to send her away with one of the other parents. So at this point in the hotel, we stayed in the hotel. It was right very close to the arena. So we rode to the arena and I walked in. Didn't have to pay any money, nothing. I went in there, watched my daughter's game, left. I didn't go back for the second game of the day. They had another game later that day. By that time, my mom was there. Actually, I think her mom got there after that. I sent her, I sent her at that point on with uh, another parent. And I set that up um, after that game. So you can see this type of maneuvering, right? It's a lot. But I would say you have to be in um, connection with Abba to really get some clarity on it. Cause it, cause I'm gonna tell you this, if we look at it through the lens of the world, we'd be like, hey man, you might come away from it. Like, man, the Shabbat is in the way. Nuh-uh, 
The Shabbat is not in the way. And that's where we got to watch what is influencing our minds because we could pull away because we're so stressed or, or frustrated with the system and trying to keep the laws in the system that we can be, we can end up, some of us can end up blaming the law instead of the system. The system is in the wrong. The law is correct. So that's the way we always got to see it, that the father's way is perfect and it's always correct. Anything contrary to that is wrong, if that makes sense. But um, so I just, I know it's, it's, it's not that, it's really not, the most high really makes it straightforward. If we, if we ask ourselves right now about this whole conversation that we have, we'd be like, man, what's making this confusing? It's the system that we live in. <laughs> it's not the law. It's the system that we live in that's making it confusing. So that's what makes it complex. Um, but the most high is very straightforward. He is, he is very straightforward. So that's a good question to Koti Sarakia. And we should probably, you know, we might revisit that another time. Um, Anybody else got anything on that? I mean, because I know it's different, right? Go uh -huh. ahead, Akoti. So I saw Soraki come off mute, and then you go, Emma Gloria. Oh, I was just gonna. I was just going to. <laughs> you're right. How how we? I guess you would call it justify this and that, right? Because to me, like. <laughs> guarding is stress free for me, you know. When I'm guarding it, I'm I'm at rest when I'm guarding it, you know. So it's like, okay, well, he said be at rest. I'm at rest in gardening, so I'm like, I'm at rest right now, you know. So, and then they mm -hmm. say it doesn't mean sit in the chair and stare at the wall. So that's what that's that. why I asked you because I'm like, I don't want to be in the wrong. Even though this is restful to me, it may still be considered some type of work, you know. So, <laughs> hallelujah. These are good questions, though. These are good questions. Um, I saw Ima, Ima Glory. What you, what you got? Go ahead, Ima. I just wanted to chime in with, with the um. Well, first of all, Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Shabbat I'll Shalom. Just chime in with what um, the Koti said. I've all I've been. I felt that sense of confusion in terms of well, what am I really supposed to do that day? I mean, I don't go to concerts, but suppose I wanted to go to a concert. I do like theater. Suppose I want to go to the theater. You know, I mean, are these things, because it's a, a blanket command, rest, but it's not any definition, A, B, C, D, and E. This is what defines rest. So I've been a bit, I've struggled with that. And um, it has interfered. Um, for example, here, there's a food bank here. That um, and I know the person that runs it. So I used to like to go over there on the Saturday, um, just to socialize and and get some produce. But I've been I've not done that since you know I've been involved with this because I felt like you know I was going to do something. At, I just didn't feel like that's what I should be doing. But you also stated that. Um, it's about conviction as well, if you feel conviction, because if I went there, I certainly wasn't going to buy or sell, you know, I was going to get, I would pick up some produce, but mm. those kind of things that I have been, um, felt a sense of confusion about. So I'm glad that um, the Akoti brought that up. Good question. I'm a, uh, Well, I will say this. Some things are kind of cut and dry, right? If it's going to require you to actual, to do some actual business, that's not an emergency. Let me say it like that. If it's not an emergency, it is going to require you to do some actual business, then that will be cut and dry. Don't don't engage in that one. Um, emergencies are a little different, right? If there's an emergency and there's a life or death situation, then of course you don't sit there and let a person die. If you see them actually going through a life or death event, um, you are to help that person out in the way that you led to. Um, as far as, and this is where, so conviction is going to come in where, you, go ahead. Oh. oh, no, I was just going to say, what about, what about the, um, uh, uh, the produce stand? You know, I mean, is that, is that work? I'm not doing, going to work. I am going to socialize and get some produce, but. So you would have to engage to get that produce using finances, right? No, 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 no. It's 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 free. Oh, 
There is a commandment, though, that on this day we don't do what? By yeah. yourself. Gather. Well, I'm, I'm going to go over it because I see now I have to go over my answer because somebody asked a question about the cooking on the Sabbath. So yes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring something out and we'll look at it. I guess we'll start off like that. Um, and because that was a question on, and I, by the way, I got the the list of questions that you all sent. I just haven't, I mean, I haven't, we didn't answer them all there. Um, you know, when we were meeting with the other group, uh, some of them, you know, I, I got them all. So we can, we can go over those at a, at a certain point, but I will touch on one of them. I see I'm going to touch on one of them today. So let me pull that one up and that's cooking on the Shabbat. Cause that's probably going to help your, your answer here, Koti. Because I want you to take my answer. I want you to get it yourself from the script. So I'm going to show you something in the script. And um, we'll go from there. Uh, let me first. I'm finishing something out because I got something interesting we're going to do today that's different. It's going to be very engaging. It is already engaging. <laughs> but uh, I'm, gonna, I'm finishing it up. I got it in the background right now. I'm just trying to finish it up. Um, it's a Kahoot, by the way. So I'm gonna, we're going to test your, we're going to do a knowledge check today, right? I want to see if you're retaining this information that I've been teaching you in regards to these offerings. So I'm trying to decide if I'm going to do it before we talk about the review, because today is a review, or should I do it after we do the review? So I might let y'all vote on that, but just to see where you are. So I was going to go over the study guide with you, so to speak, and then give you the quiz. There's no points. I took off the points, which is not a competition. It's literally a knowledge check. Now, if we do something on a day that's not the Sabbath, maybe we do competition and have a little fun with it, you know, a different type of fun with it. Uh, this is literally a knowledge check, right? So I don't want to, I felt some type of way about doing a, a, a you know, a, a, a Kahoot on the Shabbat that gave people points, if you know what I mean, for correct answers, have a leaderboard and who won, I feel a certain type of way about it, so I took the points off. That probably help you understand how I see this day. I, I'm, I see it; I, it's a little different. I, don't, I try to. <laughs> I'm a little different when it comes to this. I don't know. Some people might be might be different when they they see this day. Um, I see it the way the most I lead me to see it. I'm not knocking anybody else; it's just the way I see it. This day is so special, Mishpaka, that even the eunuch and the Nakari. They were told that if they kept this day from polluting it, that's Isaiah 56, that there was some great, there was a great blessing included, um, a great blessing for them if they, if they kept this day. That's Isaiah 56. I'm in here right now. Let not the son of the foreigner who has joined himself to Yahuwah speak, saying, Yahuwah has certainly separated me from his people. Nor let the eunuch say, look, I am a dry tree. But thus said Yahuwah to the, to the eunuchs who guard my Sabbaths and have chosen what pleases me and are holding on to my covenant. To them I shall give in my house and within my walls a place and name better than that of sons and daughters. I give them an everlasting name that is not cut off. Say lie on that. Also the sons of the foreigner who join themselves to Yahuwah to serve him and to love the name of Yahuwah to be his servants, all who guard the Sabbath and not profane it, and are holding on to my covenant, then I shall bring to my set-apart mountain, and let them rejoice in my house of prayer. Um, and that's, I cut the verse off at verse 7, but it actually goes on in verse 7 to talk about how their ascending offerings and their slaughterings are accepted on his slaughter place, on his altar. Think about that. That's, that's, a, that's a pause, sit your Bible down for a minute, and say a moment. We know we live in a system like we said, right? They don't, this system don't cater to the laws of the Most High. You're going to get notifications all blowing your phone up today about this sale, this going on, this game, all kinds of stuff, right? This world we live in, the system that we live in does not cater to the Most High's laws, his instructions, his ways. So, and that's why I was saying sometimes we have to guard ourselves because we are unduly influenced, or I'll say it like this, we are uh, subconsciously sometimes influenced to look at you know, look at things in a certain way. And we might come away with a certain understanding that the Shabbat is in the way. No, sir. No, ma'am. It's not the Shabbat. The, the, the laws of the Most High, the instructions of the Most High, they're righteous, they're pure, they're just, they're right. 
the ways of the world are not. So the world, the, the word, the most high's word is correct, but the world is, con is contrary to his word. So the world is wrong, but it has influenced us at times because we've grown up in this system. This is all we know. We didn't grow up in the land. A lot of us didn't grow up in, in Demona or the land, right? We didn't grow up where they was keeping the Shabbat. We grew up where we was, you know, this is the world we grew up in. So this is what we know. So that's the part we have to unlearn. And notice that the Most High's laws, his ways are correct, but the world's ways are contrary. Now, y'all have heard me say this before. The Ruach HaKodesh will show you how to navigate this world without compromising what you believe. That's why I told you about them situations at times, right? Where I have gone places where I did not engage in any kind of business. And I was there um, for a reason that I felt led to by the Most High. If you understand what I mean, like my, my daughter was involved, right? My, my child is there, you know what I'm saying? So in this regard, I need to, you know, I'm, I'm making myself available. Um, still trying to figure a lot of things out in regards to that. But it also points to that we need our own stuff. We need our own sports leagues. We need our own fellowships for our kids. Um, you know, I went to, side note, before I go to the, the answer I was going to give you for the Shabbat, cooking on the Shabbat. I went to a um, gathering one time. It was it was um, me and my daughter went bowling, and her best friend and her dad. So we went. We had a great conversation, and uh, we were in this establishment. And obviously, so I, the, her dad got there before we got there. So we got there, and I actually brought his daughter. So I we all met there because her dad was coming from out of town. So we all met there. And he had ordered a pizza. And so we get to the establishment and, um, you know, he had ordered the girls some food and stuff like that. And the pizza he ordered was like, it was like a half and half, right? It was pork, pepperoni, and it was like cheese. So he wasn't touching the food at first, right? So I already talked to my daughter. She already knew the deal. Whoop -de -whoop. She was good to go. Um. Me and him, him and I, we were having a, a, a conversation. He was actually interested in the truth. So now I'm having this conversation with him where I'm witnessing to him. We're having a, a fantastic conversation. Uh, he has talked about how he's always wanted to sit down. I think, if I remember correctly, he said with a Hebrew Israelite. And, and so here I am, you know, a, a Hebrew Israelite. And this opportunity, like I said, it looks to be like it was divinely appointed. So here it is, we talking. And then... You know, after the girls, they go and skate because there's a skating rink in the actual uh, place. It's a massive place. So they go and skate and he goes and grabs the rest of the pizza. Now, mind you, I'm aware that the pizza he's touching has pork on it. I look at pork as an absolute abomination. I don't want to buy. We must always be prayed up. And you always you have you must we must always have a repentant heart every day. Every day we have a repentant heart um, and you, you, there's a freedom when you, when you are, when you have a relationship with the most high, there's a great freedom there. All right. There, we know that there are sins for, excuse me, sacrifices for sins of ignorance, sins are, that are unintentional. So keep that in mind and do the best you can. That's not a, some have taken that. We know Christianity has taken that and said, well, that's grace. Christ did it. Cause we don't, so we don't have to do it. That, that that's nonsense. That don't. Christ didn't even say that. Messiah didn't say that. He didn't say you don't have to keep the law no more. Why would he leave it for us to figure out? Why didn't he tell his his disciples? But after he when he was descending, excuse me, when he was ascending in Matthew, last recorded words in the book of Matthew. Why didn't he say, oh, by the way, guys, y'all don't have to keep this law no more when I go to Shamayim? He didn't say that. He said, go teach. The other nations, everything I taught you, what do you teach them? Keep the law. You understand what I mean? So th this is where we had to get our own understanding and from, from the most high when we read and uh, we pray on everything. So even them times I told you where I've had to do, where I've gone certain places on the Shabbat, if it violated one of them tenets, if you know what I mean, one of those tenets where I was like, if it's going to require me to do business, I ain't going to do it. I can't do it. Or I'm, I'm going to do my best not to do it. Let me say it like that. That's my the principle I stand on. Uh, uh, granted, there are some situations that are a little different, like I said. So if there is a, I told you the time I had to take my daughter 
to the place that at the arena and I did not, uh, and it was on a Shabbat. So at that point, I knew I had paid for the armband for the entire weekend. So what I did was I came in and I'm, I, and basically they saw my armband. It was, I just walked straight in. I took my daughter with me. I really didn't even want to engage with them. I really didn't want to engage with them. And I'll tell you why. I don't want to do any work on the Shabbat and I don't want to cause anybody to do any work on the Shabbat. So in that regard, I really was trying to be passive when I walked in. And so I was making, I was trying to make sure my armband was visible from a long way away. So they already know he's good. He can walk straight in. And it was a big old entrance. So you, you know, you just walk through There's people standing there. Now I know they already signed up. They doing their they job. That's, that's their decision to do that work. I get that, but I don't want to be any, I don't want to be um, a partaker in that, if you know what I mean, and causing them to do any work. I know, but see, this I'm just showing y'all a little bit about how I think. So I, I'm I'm just stick to the word, <laughs> but I'm, I'm just showing you my own convictions as well in my own way, rather the way I do things. But um, yes, ma'am, go ahead, Saraki, go ahead. Um, I just want to uh, clarify because you kind of mentioned something, but didn't kind of elaborate on it when uh, Aku Gloria asked like about the theater and then she said something else. You said something about something about, well, you know, on the Shabbat, you can't gather or something like that. You didn't finish the sentence. So I'm not sure what you yeah. were talking about. That's correct. I'm, I'm about to go to that now. So technically we know the commandment is not to gather, but I'm going to also show you something else um, that I used to teach, but I no longer teach that because my understanding has grown. So I was kind of building up to it, but, um, but yeah, so let me save this in the background. I guess I'll stop it right here. I'll save this because I got a Kahoot that I'm going to do. We'll do today as a knowledge check. And it is a, um, it is just that a knowledge check is not a competition. So I took the points off. I, was, I think I've taken all the points off and it's like 15 questions. All right. Let's go to Exodus and we'll go to, um, we'll start right there. Hold up. Before we do that, let me, uh, let me pray us in since we'll, we'll make this the official start of the Shabbat. So I'll praise to the most high. Hopefully everybody had a great week. Shabbat Shalom, Mishpaka. Um, glad to have you on today. Glad to have you on. We're going to, today we're going to do a, a little review. Uh, and then we're also going to, and it's been a while since we met. Uh, Soraki, I got what you said in mind, so I'm going there. I just want to officially open the Shabbat first, and then we'll uh, we'll dive in. So Shabbat Shalom, Mishpaka. I won't make this live until we quite possibly get to the review. I'm, that's when I'll do it, do it live. A uh, couple of things I do want to address. Um, and I don't want it to lead to another spinoff conversation, but last week we, I know the past three weeks, we have been having some, um, some joint gatherings, right? Where we're doing the Q and A. And I think this has been very helpful for the Mishpaka. I think based on the feedback that I've gotten, it's helpful for a lot of people. Am, am I correct in my assessment, Mishpaka? Has, was it fun? Was it good? Yes. <laughs> it was good. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes, it was. All praise to the Most High. Um, there was a recent discussion we had last week uh, about the stranger. Um, so just keep in mind, um, I'm probably going to do a, a different. I might touch on that a little bit later because some of the understanding that went forth, or even I know it was a question asked by one of the Mishpaka, um, and some of the understanding that went forth. That's not my understanding. So I, we, you know, we didn't, we, you know, we allowed, I mean, basically there was a conversation, but we left that, but I, I perceive based on some information that I was made privy to that we need to address that in a, in a more thorough way with the Mishpaka. So I just tell you this, that based on what was some of what was said during that gathering, and I know some stuff was brought out by the Mishpaka and some questions was brought out. Um, so some of the understanding that went forth is not my understanding. And um, so we can dive into that at another, at another time. I'm not going to, I don't want to touch it right now. 
I uh, just wanted to let you know that. Um, so, and that is in regard to the stranger slash foreigner slash sojourner, whatever you want to call that person, the alien, the non-Israelite. So my understanding of that is uh, being molded by the Most High and is different than what some may uh, perceive it to be. Uh, excuse me. It's different than what some of the other, what other people may understand it to be. But some people have their own understanding. I just say it like this. Some people got their understanding. I got my understanding. So I, maybe that's a better way to say it. I have an understanding that's being molded by the Most High. And some people have their understanding. So, and we heard some stuff in the in the group being kind of asked. And that let us know, you know, it just, without me touching on it directly, because, it's, you know, like I said, I got some stuff going on in the background in regard to that. Um, but without me touching on it directly, the understanding that went forth, some of the understanding that went forth is not my understanding. I have my own understanding and some others have their own understanding. So, and every person is entitled to their own understanding, but you want your understanding to be backed by scripture. If, and, and me personally, and I know that my brothers and, and, and the men that, I that, I that I work with as a Mori, Moray is, is part of the Moreen. I know we all want to get it right. So whatever the book says is what we want to do. Um, that's what I know about uh, some of the men that I'm very close with that are Maureen. So, all right. Got that out of the way. Now. Maureen, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Maureen. Someone knocked at the door, so I kind of missed that. But I wanted to ask you, so are you in agreement that you won't let a stranger come to Pesach? No. Based on scripture, no. I can explain that in depth without going through a whole bunch of lexicon and <laughs> but it's a lot. Um, but I just show you, I just read you something in Isaiah 56, right? It said the stranger. Oh, that's why somebody knocked on the door, so I had to go go answer the door yeah. and I came back, so I missed what you said. But I know um, that was one of the things they spoke about in the other meeting that um, they wouldn't let uh, someone from another nation come to Pesach. So I was asking if you were in agreement with that as far as a stranger coming. No, I'm, I'm not in, if you ask me that directly, I answer it directly. No, I'm not in agreement with that. Now, obviously we do see that the stranger has to follow a certain protocol and there has to have to be a certain way. We're not talking about a stranger coming in, bringing their own culture, bringing their own gods, things like that. They haven't forsaken their 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 gods. They're bringing their own culture, things of that regard. No, I'm not. I'm, they can't come in like that. So if the stranger does come in, there is a certain way and protocol that the stranger has to follow and go through before he or she can come in uh, and be considered, you know, uh, part of the Commonwealth of Israel. But that's a whole different, I don't want to go down that road, but I just answer your question directly. No, I'm not in agreement with that. But it's it's way deeper than surface level. Trust me on that. <laughs> but, uh, and and actually, it was a thing that I recognized during our conversation. We, you know, obviously we saw some of the understanding coming from the crowd and like a person asked that question. And it was like, we, we I perceive this is something that we definitely might have to address later or we'll put it like this we're actually planning to address it but it is going to be in a um in a very more it's going to be a more comprehensive way it's not going to be a surface level understanding you have to truly understand the first person first thing you got to do is identify who the stranger is i'm gonna pause for a moment i got somebody trying to get in the room do y'all know a Sharde or azaria all right I don't. Okay, I'm gonna let them in. You already know, Miss Pakai. If they on some foolishness, I'm gonna hit the eject button. I'm gonna, probably gonna shut the whole meeting down. <laughs> so just <the> FYI. So, <laughs> um, my fingers on the trigger. Well, I clicked admit, but I don't know where they at. But, um, okay, they joining now. But we'll see. Hopefully, they ain't on no foolishness. Um, I don't have to shut the meeting down. Um, so the next thing I know I want to do is um, I'm gonna stand and blow the shofar. And then I'm going to pray us in and then we'll we'll go ahead and uh, go to that question that Emma Gloria had. 
And it actually ties into a question that I received about cooking on the Shabbat. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring that out. And it's going to answer Emma Gloria's question too. So I'm just waiting on them to it says they're joining. I see uh, Kevin coming in as well. Um, well, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom. Oh, in, in doing so, could you also um, kind of elaborate on Matthew 12 when it was talking about um, the disciples and picking the heads of the or going through the fields, getting the grain in the grain fields on the right. Sabbath? Could you, could you explain that too as well? Right. So at this point, they was walking in the field, right? And they got hungry. So basically, they picked up something to eat. They didn't cook it. They ate mm -hmm. it just like they had. They got it. It looks like when we look at that scripture. That's Matthew 12. And I want to say, um, yeah, in the beginning. They were, they plucked the ears of the corn and they ate them, right? It says they ate them. So they ate the corn straight out the well, it says corn in the NIV, but I don't, I don't really use the NIV. Uh, excuse me, KJV. I don't know if it was corn. It might have been. We just rock with that. But they pluck heads of grain. Grain, we know corn is grain that you can eat straight out the stalk. You don't have to do anything to it. Wheat is a little different. Um, but it looks like they were eating it. So they didn't cook it. There was no work in that regard done. But... They just they just got it to eat it. Now to Akosi Sirakia's question earlier, tending or pruning in a garden technically is work, no matter how light it is and even how soothing it might be, is technically considered husbandry. What they were doing is not considered husbandry. They were actually getting some food to eat. So uh, and and they and it looks like they may have eaten it while they were there in the in the uh walking through the field I'm, I'm assuming matter of fact hold up let me not assume let me let, let me do something real quick because i'm i got in mind the question ema gloria asked but i want to i'm going to go to the summary right quick matthew 12 king james version say this well let's do esv esv is a good verse at that time yahushua went through the grain fields on the sabbath his disciples were hungry they began to pluck heads of grain and to eat but when the pharisees saw it they said to him, look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. Messiah also brings up, have you have you not read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him? How he entered the house of Elohim and ate the bread of the presence. It's a showbread, um, which is it, it was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests or only the Levites. Now, um, He also gives another example. Have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? All right, why, why did he say that? Because they're doing work on the Sabbath. But they're guiltless. Because that work was yeah. commanded. So the type of work they were, we're going to read some stuff today, but we already know, right? So there's a, something they, they used to do every day called a continual offering. There's a continual offering every day. It's twice a day, every day, even on the Sabbath. Matter of fact, on the Sabbath day, Numbers 28 will tell you that it changed. But it was, you still did it. In the morning and between the evenings, there was a sacrifice every day. So uh, if I'm understanding this correctly, I perceive that's what he's talking about. So there was certain work that was had to be done, but it was commanded work. Uh, he says, I tell you something greater than the temple is here. Something greater than the temple is here, speaking of himself. And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless, for the Son of Man is sovereign of the Sabbath. There's another example, too, with the man with the withered hand, where he heals the man, right? And he gives him, he says, so it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Told the man, stretch out his hand, he healed the man's hand. Um, now, going back up to the plucking of the grains, because if I'm reminded also, there was another time, well, let's stick to this one right here. Uh, where they're plucking the grains and they're eating it. Now, it looks like they may have been going through the grain field and they ate it while they were on this walk. So there was it wasn't like they they put some in their bag or they, you know, they put some up, you know what I'm saying, and take back to the house with them 
It looked like they found they they was walking through the grain field and they ate the food. Looked like it was right there. It was not prepared. It wasn't cooked. It was in the grain fields and they just plucked it off and they ate it. Probably shucked the uh, the husk wherever they shucked it. If that makes sense. If if I'm making sense. Now, I give you my understanding because we this is leading me to the question that Emma Gloria because I want you to see this for yourself and then you can all make your own. Uh, you can follow the way the most eyes leading you. So follow your conviction on this. But it was something I used to teach and my understanding has grown. So I want to I want to show you what I found. And then you follow the conviction that Abba Yahuwah gives you. So we are officially starting now. Um, that other group didn't come in. I didn't stay. We're trying to come in, but they didn't. So I'm going to stand and blow the shofar and then I'll pray. And then we'll, we'll go to that first question. And today we're going to do a kahoot. So I think. Um, and it's a knowledge check. It is not going to be a, a kahoot by points, right? So I'm not going to, I don't feel like I want to do that on the Sabbath day. So it's not going to be a leaderboard and all of that. It's just for you to check your knowledge. I got 15 questions. And then we're going to do a review. I think I might do the kahoot first. Let me get a vote. Do y'all want to do the kahoot first to check where you are? Because the review is going to cover all the questions anyway. I'm basically going to give you the answers. I made the kahoot from the from the uh, the review. <laughs> So do y'all want to do the Kahoot first or do y'all want to do the Kahoot after we do the review? It's, remember, there's no point system, so it's not. It's just literally for a check for yourself. You know what? I think, I just, I think I'm going to do the Kahoot first. We're just going to do it first anyway. How about that? We'll do it first. It's just a knowledge check. That's it. All right. Now, I'm going to stand and blow the shofar, and then I'll pray, Ms. Baka, and then we'll, we'll dive into that first question uh, that Ema Gloria brought up. So give me one second. I'll be right back. Hallelujah. 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 Let us pray. Toda Rabba, Father Yahuwah, for this brand new day of life, Abba. We say Toda Rabba for this Sabbath day. Toda Rabba, Father, for all of those that you have brought into this virtual gathering, Abba. We want you here, Father. We want you to gather with us. Let your word go forth today, Father, and take deep root in our hearts and bear much good fruit in our lives for your esteem, Abba. Hallelujah. Yahuwah. Thank you, Abba, for helping us to make it through another week. We are grateful that you have blessed us with another Sabbath day. Hallelujah, Yahuwah. Torah Rabba, Abba. I pray, Father, right now that you refresh us and revive us on this day. Let today be a very relaxing day, a good day. A joyous day, Abba. Hmm. Give us thoughts that are from you. Let our thoughts be pleasing to you, Abba. Hallelujah, Hua. Let our words be pleasing to you on this day. We are grateful, Abba, that you've allowed us together, even virtually on this day. Hallelujah, Hua. We ask, Abba, that you commune with us. Give us understanding of your word, Father. For we do not want to lean to our own understanding, our own ways, our own biases. We want to make sure we're understanding things from your perspective. Light our path and guide our steps, Abba, and give us your understanding, we pray. For my brothers and my sisters on this call, Abba, you know what we may have dealt with this week. You know our, our triumphs. You know some of the valleys we may have gone through this week. You know everything we experienced this week, for we are open books before you. Hallelujah, Hua. Refresh my brothers, Abba. Hallelujah, Hua. Refresh my brothers and my sisters on this call, Abba. Mm. Revive them this day, Abba. Let this be a good day a day that we hear from you and feel your presence with us. Hallelujah, Hua. We esteem your great name, our King and our Abba. We offer up this prayer in Yahusha HaMashiach's name, and we say, Hallelujah, Hua. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Hua. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Hua. Hallelujah. Hopefully y'all had a fantastic week, Ms. Baka. Um, I'm gonna make a few co-hosts for my brothers to work. 
You already know how I do. So, all praise to the Most High. We, we made it through another week, and it's, it's the Shabbat, right? This day that we rest. Man, I know, I know, I, Lawrence, I already know, man. Babylon, this Babylonian system, I know they try to impose certain conditions on us. Some of them may for, try to force us to work. We know. Um, but we thank the Most High for blessing us with another day in the land of the living on the Shabbat. Um, so we're going to do something a little different today. I know the past three times we've met to end the calendar year off, we I came to, we came together with uh, Remnant Assembly and J.A.E. Jackson, and we just, we had a Q&A. Uh, we just did a Q&A, and I know a lot of you all submitted some questions, and I have that list of questions, and I've gone through um, quite a few of them. And there was a specific question that came up today, and I want to cover that one. And I think it's going to cover the question that Ema Gloria asked us as well. Now, this is a big question. I don't know. I'm not sure what others have taught. I can't go off that. I have to go to what the most High leads me to do. And I used to teach differently on this. So I'm going to, I'm going to show you something today and we'll, we'll go from there. Now, I'll start from there. There was a question asked, and it said, I'm going through it now. All right, here we go. Okay. It is question number, not two. We did number two. We got, it's a lot of questions, family. So, it's, well, it's quite a bit. I'll say it like that. All right, I got to do a word search. <laughs> it's that many questions. It's that many words on here. So I need to do a word search to see where we at. Because I remember what here it is. It's question number 10. Question number 10. The person asked this. They said, I'm still confused about whether we can cook on Shabbat or not. Is Exodus 35.3 in reference to all the work it took in ancient times to kindle a fire? Therefore, a lot of work had to be done. And that's why it's prohibited question mark. I hear some people say they will cook something simple that day and others who will only eat food that takes no cooking or warming up. All right. So I'll begin by saying this answer by stating that it is, it's my personal preference not to cook on the Shabbat. I've told some of you my story on how I got there, right? Um, so there was a time period where I found myself because I like to cook. But I found myself very late sometimes cooking on the Shabbat. I'm putting together the Sabbath lesson. I also work a job. You know, I work in the pharmaceutical industry. Well, about with a biotech company, they consider part of the pharmaceutical industry. But I can I can uh, manage my load, my workload, how I how I choose. I'll praise to the Most High. And I found myself at a time getting to, you know, I was very late getting getting things together. And I find myself it might be eleven o'clock at night before I'm eating. It might be five o'clock in the morning when I'm actually going to bed uh, because of my lack of preparation for one, uh, my own lack of preparation. Let me first call that out where going to bed at five, getting back up at whatever time and then doing a Shabbat together because I'm just now putting the lesson together. Um, and so I realized at a certain point that, you know, I had a, I had a conviction. This outcome resulted from a conviction of mine which progressed over some time. So I eventually stopped the practice of cooking on the Shabbat. I started to cook before the Shabbat. There's a caveat. There have been times where I've traveled and I've gotten everything I needed, but I just got to where I'm staying, the hotel room. Um, and then I cooked because I just got there. Um, but it's all got in the room and everything like that before sundown or, or got everything I needed before sundown, but I didn't, I didn't have a chance. I didn't cook it before and, and it was after the sundown while I was still cooking, in the process of cooking. So that has occurred before. Now, so I eventually stopped the practice of cooking on the Shabbat. Now, at first, it was not my understanding. I heard of it before, but it was not my understanding, right? Where they, they used to say, you're not supposed to cook on the Shabbat. It wasn't my understanding at that time. And that said, I have cooked on the Shabbat, like I said, very rarely and not very often at all since implementing that practice such as in the circumstance of travel. Now, I used to think and teach that there is no explicit commandment not to cook on the Sabbath day, but there was a commandment not to gather, not to gather, right? Gather the materials you need on the Sabbath day. 
which would take buying and selling on today or in today's world, right? Or not for everybody, you can go out to a garden and gather some things on the Shabbat to cook as well. Uh, or a produce stand, which was brought up today. So I have now changed my belief. And I perceive that scripture does indeed instruct us to prep our food before the Sabbath day. Now, again, I don't know what anyone else teaches on this, but I'm going to show you something in scripture. And then we'll, we'll, we'll go from there. The first place I want to examine is Exodus 16, verse 23. It's from the contents of this verse that I can now see where one may perceive it means also not to cook on the Sabbath. So I put it on the screen and then I bring it out, bring it up mechanically in Hebrew. So Exodus 16, and I'll show you verse 23. I'm going to use the TS 2009 for this first part. All right. This is where I think it first came from. Where a lot of people are seeing, right? So, so this is verse 23 on the screen. Exodus 23, 16, 23. It says, and he said to them, this is what Yahuwah has said, tomorrow is a rest, a Sabbath set apart to Yahuwah. That which you bake, bake. That which you cook, cook. And lay up for yourselves all that is left over to keep until Boker. That's the morning. All right. Now, I'm going to show you some other stuff in this chapter because you'll see something even in this chapter if you just read it in English. But sometimes I think, me personally, I had like a little bias with it because I, you know what I'm saying? You, you know what I mean? We, this goes back to what we were talking about earlier. Well, we live in a society that has sometimes subconsciously influenced us to look at this, at the Sabbath as being in the way to look at the laws of the most high as being in the way, but no, the laws of the most high are the way every, anything contrary to his way is wrong. So we have to unlearn and actually think, relearn the correct way and think about things from his, his perspective. Now, in English, we see what it says, right? Tomorrow is a rest. I'm not, am I sharing my screen? Am I sharing the correct screen? Let's see what screen I'm sharing. Yes, I'm sharing. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, we what can it says, see it. You see the word tomorrow is a rest. You see the, the word bake, bake. Bake bake is uh is actually you see it back to back right in the, in that uh in the actual the way it's written cook cook the way it's written and you see boker at the end of the, the end of the verse now in Hebrew mechanically I I read it in a, it's from Jeff Benner's site but it um if you look at it in a translated way it's like he's saying and he will say to them or he said to them. That is what Yahuwah said. Tomorrow is a rest period, a ceasing, a special time for Yahuwah. Bake what you will bake, boil what you will boil, and leave for yourself all the exceeding for a charge until the morning. Hmm. Okay. Now that's that's the that's a translated ver version of it when you look at the the Ibri. Now I'll pull it up in the screen on the screen for you. I'll just pull up my notes. How about that? Because I'm looking at my notes right now. So let me pull up my notes and I'll show you my notes just for the Ebri. So I'll switch over and let you see my notes for the Ebri. All right. New share. Now you should see my screen. Okay. Now, now you should see my notes. Okay. So this is mechanically and you see how it's written mechanically. Mecha Hebrew is very mechanical when you translate it. The English is the, the translator's job or his attempt or her attempt, whoever is translating it, to make it palatable for you to read it, so to speak. But Hebrew is very mechanical. The word for t uh, tomorrow is mahar. And you're also going to see that um, you see the word bake here twice. It says tofu, afu, right? When it says boil, you see it twice. Tevashlu, bashevlu, bashelu. Okay, now let's go on down here and see if we can verify that in the actual Ibri, the way it's written, right? So when you go through these words, you're going to come to a point where 
you're you're gonna see uh some of the words that that are gonna they're gonna they're gonna basically uh you're gonna see them written back to back and that's what I want you to see and actually no, I'm, I'm showing you the, let me show you this let me go to Bible Hub I got it pulled up yeah Bible Hub will show it to you a little bit clearer more clear than I have it in my notes so Exodus 16 and that verse 23. Now, I'm going to show you something else in the chapter, but I'm going to start with Exodus 16, 23. All right. So here it is. And I pull it up in interlinear and you should see my screen momentarily. And here it is. All right. Now, okay. Now you see it here, right? So we can kind of follow this a little bit, a little bit better. You see... Boil, boil. Why is doing that? Right here in this section, right here. It's thirteen ten. The word is thirteen ten, written twice, back to back. Anytime you see something in the Hebrew written twice like that, there's an emphasis on it. So it's telling you, on this day before the Sabbath, it's emphasizing that you're going to boil or you're going to bake before the boker, before that day comes in. Technically, really. The word for tomorrow is Mahar, right? So if you look at this word, it's talking about the day following the present day. So it is giving us a timestamp that this acti these activities listed in this verse are associated with the day uh, before the, the next day. Mahar is telling you is the Sabbath. It says tomorrow, this next day, the day following this one is a Sabbath. And he says on that day, you're going to have a season, right? So we see these two activities being associated with the sixth day. Now, let's go a little, let's go even another to another place. Let me let me pull the scripture back up. I got it up. So now let's go over here back to 16 and we're gonna stay there for a minute, just on 23, but I'm gonna show you something else. Let me run back over here to my notes. So the translation of that verse. Is like saying, and he said unto them, This is that which the that Yahuwah, which Yahuwah has, has spoken, tomorrow, Mahar, is a solemn rest, a holy Sabbath unto Yahuwah. Bake that which unto Yahuwah, bake that which you will bake, and see that which you will seethe or boil, and all that remaineth over lay up for you to be kept unto the boker. Remember the context, right? In this, in the same, in this Hebrew text, the same words are duplicated to refer to boiling and seething, and baking. In Hebrew, like I mentioned, this type of double speak implies emphasis on the word or the activity, and these cooking activities are associated with the sixth day, not the Shabbat. Now, if we keep this simple and straightforward, we can see that people are told that the Sabbath day is coming. If we read this verse, Moshe is telling them the Sabbath day coming, y'all. That's the day of rest. It's a day of season. If we go all the way back to verse 5 in this same chapter, let me, let me go back to verse 5. And this is just in English. You can see this in verse 5. Who is speaking? Let's first identify who's speaking. The people set out from Elam, right? They, they came to the wilderness of sin. That's between Elam and Sinai, or Sinai. Got there on the 15th day of the second new month after they left out of Egypt. Congregation of the children, they grumbled against Moshe and Aharon, right? They're in the wilderness. Children of Asherah said to them, if only we had died by the hand of Yahuwah in the land of, the, of Egypt, when we sat by the pots of meat and when we ate bread of satisfaction. So you get in the context of what's going on in this chapter. For you have brought us out into the wilderness to put all this assembly to death with hunger. And Yahuwah said to Moshe, now the father speaking, see, I am raining bread from the heavens for you. And the people shall go out and gather a day's portion. How much? a day's portion every day in order to try them, whether they walk in my Torah or not. They gather a day's portion every day. Now look at verse five. It shall be on the sixth day that they shall prepare what they bring in. Make sure everybody see that word. It says prepare what they bring in and there shall be twice as much as they gather daily. All right. Right here, we see the father telling Moshe that when they go out every day, they're going to gather a day's portion on the sixth day. They're going to prepare what they bring in and they're going to bring in twice as much as they gathered on them other days. Hmm. OK, that's what, that's verse five. Let me highlight it for us. Let 
Just keep that on the screen for a minute because this is the father speaking here, not Moshe. Moshe is speak, being spoken to by the father. Now, let me go back to my notes. So we see that this is a commandment from the Most High to gather twice as much on the sixth day and prepare it on the sixth day. In previous times, I think I missed this, just being honest, facts, because I feel like I have my own bias, right? Like, you know, it's all right to cook on the Shabbat and you start making up your own kind of justifications. And I think I did that. So I feel like I missed that and I feel like it was really don't do to my own selfish interests. I have to admit that. Moshe also reiterates in verse 29. Let me let me go back. Let's go to verse 29. Look at verse 29. See, because Yahuwah has given you the Sabbath, therefore he is giving you bread for two days on the sixth day. Let each one stay in his place. Do not let anyone go out of his place on the seventh day. It's not saying stay in your house and just look at the wall. That's not what this saying. <laughs> this is saying don't go out to gather food to cook on this day because the Most High is giving you six days to do that. And on the sixth day, he says you are to prepare it like it tells us in verse five. In fact, you gather more than enough. So you don't, you're not even tempted to go out. Miss Bukai, sometimes when I go to the store for my, <laughs> when I'm prepping for the Sabbath, man, sometimes I'll be buying like I'm prepping. <laughs> I just do that sometimes. It's like, man, let me get extra this, extra this, knowing that I don't need all of that, but it's just. It's like a it's like a habitual. I don't know. I'm just putting myself. I'm making sure I got all the comforts that I want on this day, so I don't have to go out and um, and gather on this day, or be tempted to go to the store. If you know what I mean. I'm like, ah, I forgot something. There was a time one time where I forgot um, water, and I like to drink spring water. I, don't, I I really do not want to be. I don't want to drink tap. I'm not saying I have it. But I do. I try to avoid drinking tap at all times. Um, but I do go to coffee shops and I understand they use tap water. I get that. So there are times where I do consume tap water. But um, I forgot some water one time. So I was like, man, let me run down here to this uh, to this dollar store. I was I was out of town at this time. Went to the dollar store. Dollar store is in the black side of town. And it, it surprised me. No spring water in Dollar General, which carries spring water. They were out or they just, they didn't, they were out. So I had to drive considerable distance. Now it's all four to seven. Now I'm, I'm trying to rush just to get water. So again, that's why I say something that's just a little note. Cause sometimes I buy like that when I buy on the, buy for the, for the Sabbath. But keep in mind, you don't have to wait to the sixth day to actually do this. That's another step you can add to your prep as well. You don't have to wait till Friday to go out and do things. Um, I dropped the ball that day, but I actually, I picked it back up. I picked it back up. I ain't fumble. So here in 29, we see right here, right? In, in verse 29, um, Moshe is reiterating that the Most High gave the children of Israel bread for two days on the sixth day. Now, when we go back to verse 23, there is an instruction to cook. Let's slide back up six verses. These two words right here, cook, cook. Remember I was telling you when it's behind, when you see it written twice in the Ibri, there's emphasis on that word, the, the word or the activity. Um, so this instruction is associated with which day? The sixth day. And what is cooked on the sixth day and left over is supposed to be for the boker on the seventh day. Selah. So when I read this now, I clearly see that we are not to cook a new meal on the Sabbath day. A new meal. I'm talking about an entirely new meal. We are to eat what was prepared on the sixth day. As the preparation was for the Sabbath day. It was for the seventh day. So you are setting this day up on the sixth day. Now, now that that is established, there one slight distinction could exist. When you read this chapter, Exodus 16, you will see that the people went out in the daytime together. Verse eight says that they had bread in the morning and meat in the evening. Part of verse 12 says 
between, oh, let me go to verse 8 first, and then I go to verse 12. Verse 8, you can see it on the screen. Moshe said, in that Yahuwah gives you meat to eat in the evening and in the morning bread to satisfaction. For Yahuwah hears your grumblings which you make against him. And what are we, Moshe and Aaron? Your grumblings are not against us, but against Yahuwah. All right. Now let's go to verse 12. Verse 12, Yahuwah spoke to Moshe saying, I have heard the grumblings of the children of Israel speak to them saying, between the evenings, you are to eat meat. And in the boker, you are to be satisfied with bread and you shall know that I am Yahuwah, your Elohim. And that's when the quails came up at evening and covered the camp. You see that in verse 13. So now, let me go back over here to my notes. So part of verse 12 says, between the evenings you are to eat meat, in the morning you are to be satisfied with bread. Verse 13 says that quail came up at evening and covered the camp. The manna came in the morning, right? The bread. Now each man was to go out and gather it according to their need when it came, and it came in the morning. So he had to go out there and gather it according to their need, and they were not to leave of it until the morning, not on the not on the first six days, right? Of the first five days. You you to go out there, you you couldn't leave it to the morning. Remember, it was stinking, it would have worms. They told they were told not to. You had to gather each day what you needed. On the sixth day, you gather, they gathered twice as much. And it didn't spoil the next day. That's a miracle. Same bread, but it didn't spoil the next day because they followed the instruction. So it says on the sixth day, they gathered twice as much. And at this time, they, it could be left until the morning of the seventh day. They are instructed to prepare it and lay it up till the morning. So they did what they did with it. They prepared it and laid it up. The potential distinction that I'm highlighting is this. Did the people prepare what they brought in from the field during the morning daytime and eat it then also, which is verse 12? If so, this will be before sundown, which is my current understanding of when the day begins. Thus, the Sabbath will begin at sundown on the sixth day at eve. If so, they did not do any prep of the manna that night. And as I think of it, quite possibly no gathering of prep or quail that evening as well, because the quail are not mentioned on that day. Um, but I'm just bringing that up because the term mahar in, is used in 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 Hebrew in verse 23, and the term boker is used. Mahar refers to the next day. Literally, it's just talking about a next time period following the present day. And boker refers to the actual specific time of the day. So it's saying that time is considered from sunrise to noon in on our, on our clock, but really it's considered the, the all the day really from my understanding until a certain time period in the evening in the Hebraic sense. Now I bring all that out to say, this um it, it may imply the use of these terms may imply and, and along with the context in the chapter it may imply that they prepared everything prior to sundown if so this also signifies to us when the day begins at sundown but i'm gonna I'm, i can get into something else on that in a minute in the morning they had enjoyed they enjoyed the manner that they had already prepared now specifically the person asked about exodus 35 and 3 so I go to that right quick because they, they asked about this verse. We're still in the same book, but I'm going to slide over to 30, chapter 35 in the third verse. In the third verse, it says this. Do not kindle a fire in any of your dwellings on the Sabbath day. Now, let me go back up. Let me, I'm going to start from verse 1. I showed you verse 3, but let's start from verse 1. Moshe assembled all the congregation of the children of Yasharal and said to them, These are the words which Yahuwah has commanded you to do. Work is done for six days, but on the seventh day it shall be set apart to you, a Sabbath of rest to Yahuwah. Anyone doing work is put on it is put to death. Do not kindle a fire in any of your dwellings on the Sabbath day. Another subject is discussed after that. So one could, you could readily assume, or reasonably assume rather, that these first three verses are going together. So two and three are going together. So this kindling of a fire I say it like this. So knowing the context from chapter 16, we read that, and I, I perceive Exodus 35, 3 may be talking about kindling a fire for the purposes of business or of cooking a new, different one than what was prepared on the sixth day, a new, entirely different meal. Not necessarily for keeping warm. Or, you know, if your family cold, like you're not just going to let your family be in the cold. You're going to make sure your family is warm. 
Uh, and I've actually heard one of my elders say that uh, in those times, they may have actually kept the fire going after starting it before the Sabbath. I haven't verified that myself, but they actually may have done that. I'm not sure. Um, but what if the fire went out? You're not just going to let the fire go out. What if a wind gust came and knocked the whole fire out? No, you're still you're going to go light that fire, if you know what I mean. You're not going to let your, your children, your wife, and your babies, you know, be cold. Um, so I perceive that there may be a need to distinguish the purpose of the fire. And it looks like if we look at the context, this fire, like a fire for keeping warm may be acceptable, yet a fire for business purposes or cooking an entirely new meal on that day is not, from my current understanding. So verse three and two look like they're linked in the same chapter, which implies that the Sabbath day is for resting, not working. Now, I'll end with this. In regard to heating food up on the Sabbath, <laughs> such as what was that food that was prepared prior to the Sabbath, uh, I have heard one of my elders talk about it being allowed, right? I've heard, I've been, uh, he, matter of fact, he called his lesson on it, he called it Shabbat guidance because it's kind of a, a gray area, I guess. He kind of identified it as that. So that may actually be allowed. Um, and, and I have done so even after my conviction to stop cooking on the Sabbath, like I've warmed food up. However, here's my caveat. I, this is something that I would also like to get a greater understanding of the word for kindle is ba'ar, and it means to begin to burn, be kindled, or start burning. So that comes to mind in verse 3. That's that's what's in uh, chapter 35. So I keep that in mind when it's talking about, you know, warming food up too. So I bread, technically, you don't have to warm up, but I'm a, I'm a, you see where I'm going with this. So although we press buttons nowadays to heat food up and cooking is less laborious activity than in ancient times, right? Um, I just think we should get an, get an aim to get an understanding of these principles in the original form in which they were given. So I'm still learning on this one. And if my understanding changes like it already did, I, I told you what I teach now, I can revisit this topic for correction if needed. So hopefully this helped. Let me stop sharing my screen. So hopefully this helped, Ms. Bukai. I know, Ima, you had that question. And I see your hand, Dion. I'm going to come to you next. And Ima, you had that question about going to the market or just a produce stand and it just kind of, they was going to give you some food. Technically, it looks like we can't do that. Even if you don't have to pay for it on the Shabbat. So I'll give you a chance first, you and Sarakia, because I think both of y'all had like a similar question. If y'all had something to say in regard to that, and then I can go to Dion. Oh, well, for me, it was. Go ahead. It, it was, was a you dropped off. Oh, it was her her question about the um, can she go to the theater or something like that? I sure, I'm sure she'd buy the tickets a different day. And you mentioned right. you can't gather, you can't gather on the Shabbat. So that was kind of my uh, question because I don't remember that being said that we can't gather on the, especially since we gather for assembly. So then it's like what what oh, can we gather for? Specifically, gather. Uh, food items let me let me make sure i make that clarification there so yeah so it just, we can't gather food items for the purposes of cooking them on the shabbat is my understanding of it but um okay i, I see i yeah. thought you meant gather <laughs> she said she goes to fellowship and to get food she says she goes to do both of them but yeah. um like a Koti said as far as the them walking through the cornfield and, and getting some corn and eating it wouldn't that kind of be the same thing if she just kind of walked through the the place where there's food, especially if she's getting fresh fruit and just eat it, that she doesn't cook it or something like that? So, Everything's like has some kind of gray areas. <laughs> no, that's a so that's a good question. That's why I when we went to Matthew 12, I was like, if we look at it, it looks like the disciples, when they pulled the, the husk, the, the corn out, they ate it right there in that field. Like they didn't pack any in their bag to take back to the house. It looked like they just got something to eat. Grab some off a fruit tree, you eat it. Grab some off a, a, a corn stalk, you eat it. But you're not gathering it, so to speak, to build up, take back to your house and put in your pantry or prepare or cook. You just ate it as it was. That, I perceive, is a little different. Now, if she was to go to the stand, and I guess Ema's phone went out. She was on here. But if she was to go to the stand and just eat it while she was there fellowshipping, not taking anything home, I perceive that could be different, right? But as far as like um, 
them giving her produce and her taking some back to put in her pantry and even possibly prepare, if not that day at a later time, that could be considered gathering technically, even though she didn't pay for it. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay. Yeah, it does. But yeah, if you out there fellowshipping and you're at the fruit stand and they bust up one of them watermelons, oh yeah, we eat, let's eat. You know, that's that's different. But man, go and pack me up two or three of them watermelons and let me take them back. Yeah, go ahead, brother, grab me. Now it's a little different, right? Because now I could be gathering in that regard versus I'm just eating a meal with some brothers. They just had some food out. But yeah, I know gray areas. A coachy, uh, it, it could be seen like that, perceived like that. A coachy Dion, go ahead, a coachy. Um, I think I want to say, first of all, Shabbat Shalom, everyone, and, and Moray. Um, sure. um, I think, I think I understand now. I wanted more clarity on Exodus 16, 29, but I'm reading it again myself using my phone because when it says, let every man remain in his place, let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. So, but that's all still in reference to gathering the food, right? Not meaning we have to stay at home, right? Right. It's that's, just reading it in context. I had to read it in context. Yes, ma'am. I'm glad you brought that out because you're definitely not supposed to just be, you know, it, it's not saying like, because Sirachia said something earlier, I think you weren't on, but she was like, are we supposed to just sit and look at the walls? Like, no, that's that's definitely not. Like me and my family, we've gone to the park. We've done various things on the Shabbat, obviously, that didn't require us having to spend any money and things like that. And if you and to give you even further context, if you go back up, you will see that after they got the original content con command, people still went out on the next day. And then most most had it, he told Moshe like, and then they had to gather like, what y'all doing? Don't do this anymore. You know what I mean? So, um, so they actually still went out <laughs> after they was told. Not yeah, to. I apologize for that. I wasn't on um, oh, when good. you had that conversation, so I apologize for making you repeat yourself. <laughs> No, that's good. That's I, I actually didn't even, I'm glad you brought that up because I didn't bring that point out at first. There were some people that did go out at first. And that's why when you get to 29, it was saying, let no man go out of his house. Moshe is speaking in context at this point. Like, hey, you got to get it on the sixth day. Don't go out there gathering on the, on the seventh day. Ain't going to be none out there. Because it actually says they went out and it weren't, and there was none out there. <laughs> so, um, Toda. Yeah. I hope, uh, but it's good that we have conversations like this. That was a good question um, that Ema brought up and you too, Sirachia. Yeah, that was actually a good question. Um, and, you know, I appreciate you bringing it out because I found it. Verse 27, some of the people went out to, on the seventh day to gather. It actually tells them why they went out, verse 27, but they found none. So, uh, but yeah, I, that's why I say I try to get understanding from the Most High, Miss um, Bukai. Like I said, I had my own conviction when it came to this before I even knew about it. Because, you know, you hear like, well, you know, you ain't supposed to be cooking on the Sabbath and all of this stuff. You're like, man, I don't see that in the book. You know what I'm saying? And I've read past this super fast. And I'm like, well, this talking about something else. And, you know, but I see now when I go back and look at it Hebraically and look at the actual verses and the words used. It's actually talking, it's associating cooking and baking and boiling all on with the sixth day, not with the seventh. So, uh, Akoti Latoya. Oh, Shalom. This, I just got a testimony about this. It's amazing. So, the last few days I've been in a secret place. I've been seeking the most high for correction. And mm -hmm. just to, to make sure that I am in his way. I want to be in his way. And so he instructed me to go and read. He instructed me to go and read. I think it was Exodus 16 and Exodus um, 23. And I was, I'm, I read it and then I was like, Father, what are you trying to tell me? And so then I read it again and I read it again. He was like, read it again. I was like, I read it again. And I was just trying, I was like, okay. <laughs> What are you trying to tell me? And so I'm just sitting on my bed and I'm just like, are you telling me? And, and the first thing came to my spirit was like, are you telling me that? I, I think it went out of coach. I don't know if it, can anybody else here? Okay. 
Oh, it, it, am I am I back? Now you back. <laughs> now you back. You stopped that. Are you telling me? And it just cut out. So. And so I was like, I, I asked him, I said, are you telling me that I'm not keeping the Shabbat correctly? That I'm doing something wrong on the Shabbat? And, and mm -hmm. that's what I felt in my spirit. But I, I was just waiting for him to confirm it. And this is the confirmation. This is, wow. I'm just my blown. Yeah. <laughs> I'm my blown. All praise to the most high and told I'm right just for your just for your obedience to the most high because this is just confirmation for him to he's he is correcting me on how to correctly keep his Sabbath day because I was so adamant on seeking his face. Like I need to know what it is that you require of me and what it is that I'm supposed to be doing because I just started seeing all these things going on in my life. And I was just like, father, am I doing something wrong? A am I doing something wrong? And so I just devoted my time all week to seek him and what it is that I need to do to get back in your way. And this was somewhere that he had led me. And that was the very first thought that had came into my spirit after I done read both of these, both of these chapters uh two or three times. <laughs> then it was like, Am I not keeping the Sabbath correctly? Are you telling me? Is that what you're telling me? So yeah. this is amazing, y'all. Toda, Toda, Yahua, Toda. It's just so amazing. Toda, Cody, man. That's uh, hallelujah. I'll praise you the most high. That's that. When I hear stuff like that, it encourages me and and confirms things with me. Um, I had this answer for I don't know how long now. But today when Ema asked the question, I was like, let me bring it up. It was proper proper for me to bring it out. And I don't know what I'm doing, Mr. Pakai, except the most I showed me. Let me just say it like that. I'm a vessel. That's how I see myself. Facts. Like I'm a vessel. So I don't take sitting in this seat lightly. Um, that right there is blessed me a Koti when you brought that out. And I truly appreciate that. Hallelujah. Um, I see some questions in the chat. Um, I'll address the last one first. It says, what about feeding the homeless? So technically, like we've we've done something. Uh, well, we fed the homeless, but we've done it on a different day. We don't do it on the Sabbath day. Now, the homeless are definitely welcome because when we gather Personally, like y'all know, y'all that came to Madison for the in-person gathering, we prepped all of that food before y'all came. We didn't cook nothing on the Sabbath day. Now, granted, we did warm the food up. We had the food warming up for everybody that so it could be warm for people to eat. But all the food was cooked and prepped before that. Um, so you can invite homeless to your gathering where food is already prepped for them. You can feed them on the Sabbath, but just don't do the preparation of the food on the Sabbath for them but definitely that you can feed the homeless on the Sabbath. It's lawful to do good on the Sabbath. So that's a good thing. Um, I'm still, me personally, since I since the Most High gave me this understanding of this recently, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out the warming up of the food part. I'm just trying to figure that out. I, I can't say, I'm, right now, I don't know if you, if you can, if you can't. I'm just saying, I had one of my elders, he actually bring out that you can. I'm just trying to figure that out myself first. This this is where I started. So I'm starting right here. Like, all right, let me stop cooking. I see that clearly. So I'm gonna chill on that. The warming up part, you know, I don't I'm still trying to figure that part out. But so I can say to that question to Coach Tara, I I don't know. <laughs> and the Coach Sailor, I don't know. I will tell you what my, my elder has told taught me. He, he has taught that it is okay. Um, but I, I'm just saying I don't I don't know. So I'm I gotta get my own figuring out on that one. Toda Mish Baka, this is uh that blessed me, Koti, when you brought when you said that. I appreciate you. Um and you, I appreciate that. You spending time in that secret place. Most high gonna he definitely you can hear him clearly too when you just block everything out. He's gonna start hearing him say stuff. <laughs> All right. I'm so full of joy right now. I'm so full of joy. That that is just like <laughs> that just got me so Oh, I'm so grateful. But that just got me so full. I'm so grateful. <laughs> Hallelujah. No praise to the most high. I love I love to hear things like that, Akoti. Um, that you you have heard something from the most high. That's a beautiful thing. Um I got some other questions on the list, but I'm not I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold off. Um and I think the Akoti that asked that question, hopefully that answered your question too, because there was an Akoti that asked me that question. Um so 
previously on our gathering as well, and I don't, I don't know if I brought quite uh, clarity to this. It was about the Book of Jasher. Um, my recommendation that if you or Jubilees, if you're gonna if you're gonna read any book, let me say it like this: Pray before you read anything, even if it's in the canonized text, even if it's in the sixty six. Pray for understanding before you read Apocrypha or Pseudepigrapha. Same thing. Pray before you read them. Um, so. I think we answered that one, but I was just because it was a question about uh, Isaac taking Rivka when she was 10 years old, because I think Jasher says that. But when you look in the 66, it says Isaac married her. He was 40, but he didn't have children with her. He didn't have his sons until she was till he was 60. So 20 years passed. So I don't know. So they, they could be going along with each other where he saw he took her at 10, but I don't know. It doesn't give us an age in, in, in the book of uh, Genesis. It doesn't give her us her age, but um, in Jasher, I think it's Jasher, it does give us her age. But it says that when he saw her, she was told me, oh, that means she looked really good. So I, I don't know if she was 10 and, you know, because a 10 year old ain't as, it's possible, but I'm just saying, I guess, it's possible back in them times, I guess, different diet, different times, different culture. Maybe she looked a certain way where he was able to recognize that she looked very good to him, even at 10, because obviously she was she might have been pre puberty at that point. Oh, you get what I'm saying, Miss Pacat? I don't know exactly what age she was taking at, but we do see that he it was 20 years before he had twins with her. And he recognized her as very good looking. So that's what I mean. So I don't know that there, there had to be sometimes a 10 year old may still look a little girlish. If you understand what I mean, versus a woman, you say it, say you say that same 10 year old four or five years later, there's a lot of changes that occur in that time period. Now she may look more woman ish still. A, she's still a young lady, but she's now looking more woman. If you know what I mean, because of uh, the the biological uh, clock and things that have been going on. So. Um, yeah. All right. So Jasher, anything you read, I just a really general statement on that. Just be careful and pray before you read anything. And if you can, try to find the oldest copy of some of these books. And because some of these books vary, the book in the Sefer, the book of Enoch in the, Se in the Sefer varies. I don't, I do not use the Sefer Bible. I don't know who on here uses the Sefer, but I got my own reasons for not using the Sefer. I won't go too deep into that, but there's some stuff in, in Noah's in Enoch, there's some things that appear to have been changed based on something that I saw in the Sefer. All right. But I'm, somebody brought that to my attention, and I'm looking at a, a copy by R.H. Enoch, uh, excuse me, R.H. Charles, who did that that translation. Um, and he cites so many fragments that he used and how he got his preamble to before you even get to the book is massive. So he literally writes an essay on how he translated the book, the fragments he used, why he didn't use this one, why he used that one. So now when I get into the text, and I don't agree with everything he says because some of his commentary, I don't agree with some of everything he says in some of his commentary, but he there's a highlight about uh, some some of the luminaries and that's different in the separate version versus other versions of uh, Enoch. So you just have to be careful, Ms. Um So technically, the, the versions I read, and I'll tell you the versions I, I, I read, I go with the TS 2009 done by the Institute for Scripture Research out of South Africa. I do not agree with everything that they, the way they translate everything either. I will use the ESV. English Standard Version is a very good translation. They do a pretty good job. Um, I will, the KJV as well. You just had to know, you had to get past the old English type stuff and you had to just see how it was originally translated. Not saying I trust everything, the way it, everything was translated. Uh, but I will use those ESV, TS 2009, preferably the TS 2009, ESV, and because it gives it to you in plain language sometimes. And then the um, KJV, NKJV has done a good job because they, the new King James, because they have gone and made some corrections that they were, they were wrong. They now put the father's name in the new King James version. You will see Yah written out. Psalm 68, 4, you can see the father's name written out. It used to be Jah. Everybody seen that back in the day in the Bible when you see it, it say J A H right there. Uh, but it's actually Yah. There ain't no J in Hebrew. But anyway, um, I will use the Amplified very sparingly. 
because I do the way they amplify certain things. Yeah, I, just very sparingly, very, very sparingly. I don't really mess with the NIV. I'm not necessarily all the way against it. I just don't mess with it. Uh, but the main versions is the ESV, the KJV, and the TS 2009 with the preference being the TS 2009. Now, and what I really try to do, Mr. Bukai, is if you're reading something, and this is, this, uh, this is very helpful. If you're reading a psalm, say you're reading a passage, and it's, it's impactful to you, I recommend you go look at the Hebrew too. Best you can. Pull up Bible Hub. Just click on interlinear Bible, and it's going to show you the words for how they translated it. And you'll be able to put the words together yourself because because when I read, remember reading about uh, David strengthening himself in Yahuwah, all right? And that's an impactful passage. Okay, it says he strengthened himself in the Lord. Okay, let me go look at this. It says he strengthened himself in Yahuwah. You know, it says the Lord in your English Bible. If you go look at the word for strengthened, the word there is chazak. What does chazak mean? It says he anchored himself, tied himself. What, now you can go deeper because you got an understanding of the Hebrew word. David had an experience. Now, this is when he was on the run from Saul, by the way. They got back to Ziklag. Their wives, their kids was gone. And the men had burned everything and took it. There wasn't nobody there. It was burnt. The men wanted to kill David. This is when David strengthened himself in the Most High. So this is a very special, critical time. Kazakh himself, tied himself to Yahuwah. So what does that mean, right? Okay. David had an experience with the Most High. He was anointed to be king. He killed a bear, he killed a lion, he killed Goliath. All these experiences, he got to a place where he could reflect in his mind on what the Most High done, done for him. I remember what you did for me. I strengthened myself in you. I tied myself, I anchored myself. And when you go and look, he bound himself to the Most High. These men that was just rocking with him wanted to kill him, y'all. Y'all, you got to put yourself in them situations sometimes. When somebody trying to kill you, not one, but about 500 of them. Yeah, it's your fault, man. We lost everything because of you. We was following you. We was over there with them Philistines. You the one led us over there. Left our families over here. David got to deal with all that. Now he got to go what? Get by himself. He told the priest, bring me the ephod. You know what the ephod is, right? When you want to inquire the most high. That was a priestly garment. David said, bring me the ephod. He was serious. He got to a place where he was trying to connect with his heavenly father who had done everything for him. Know he was in order to be king. He'd been on the run for his life. Been running from Saul. Saul trying to kill him. You understand what I mean? Now he gets to this place where he can anchor himself, strengthen himself. Says he got a word from the Most High, and that word was a guarantee. They went and got everything back. But he first had to get himself right. Hallelujah. So that's why I say if you are reading and you read something, and you're like, man, I want to, let me look at this in another translation. Try the ESV. Try the you know a plain language bible i will use the bibles from the 1700s uh the dewey rames bible uh that's all on your app it's free by the way these are free bibles you don't have to go buy these if you don't want the hard copy you don't have to buy them but i will use that and i will use the king james version with the apocrypha they do have that version on your on there as well but the key thing is praying for discernment so i think what we're gonna do I, we already didn't start it, but I feel like this has been helpful. We're going to do the, the way I'll do the review for these offerings is the Kahoot. I'm going to do the Kahoot. I want to, I want to explain something, Mishpachai, that these protocols that we read, they are very sacred. They are very sacred. Someone asked me before about, you know, uh, possibly like a replica, showing a video or something, how to, the tabernacle look. I think a coach share brought it up. She's not on right now. Um, you know, there are people that build replicas of this. They build replicas of the tabernacle of meeting. They do this. I don't, I don't agree with it. Um, I got my reasons for not agreeing with it. Do y'all understand that these are sacred instructions? I found some online. I'm not saying I'm against the people. It's just me personally. I don't necessarily agree with building a replica replica. I know there's a guy, he got a website where they, they rebuild the Ark of the Ark of the Covenant and they sell them, from my understanding. For for like purposes in the church, if you wanted to use it for, I guess, like a demonstration or yeah, they they sell them. Um and I'm not knocking him because I've actually learned from some of the that man's teachings. It's just um, yeah, I got my own thoughts about this. They got a traveling tent of uh, tabernacle of Moses. 
where was this? Uh, I looked it up last night. Where they go set this up? Oh, the Church of Mormon. Behind one of their churches, they got the the life size replica, from my understanding of this, of the uh, Tabernacle of Moshe. Moshe, and people can go visit this, right? Uh, I'm I'm just these were sacred instructions that were given to Moshe. And this is how I look at this. I'm looking, these are my ancestors. This is how I look at this. This ain't just a book I read. You know what I'm saying? This is not where I'm coming from. I ain't looking at this like, oh, this is my religion. No, this is not a religion to me. These are my ancestors. King David, that's my ancestor. King Shlomo, that's my ancestor. Moshe, Abraham, Yaakov, Yitzhak, those are my ancestors. You understand what I mean? Um, so that's how I look at it. So this is sacred. When Moshe received by revelation, guys, this is the pattern that the Most High gave me. That's modeled after what's in the Shamayim. This is the pattern for the tabernacle. I don't play with that. I don't, want, don't play with that. So I know somebody asked me to. I, I, I would, could pull up videos, but I'm not going to do I don't want to. I don't want to do it. So I'll show you something like a diagram that someone drew. Um, but just keep in mind, there are people that are building these, the actual, uh, you know, replicas. But we'll do that. After we get into the review, I just want you to understand how sacred this is, because there are principles in these offerings that we can apply today to your relationship with the Most High. A Koti Latoya just talked about how she got in the secret place. The Most High led her to chapter 16. Not only read it once, read it again, read it again. You, when you're in that secret place, you can hear from the Most High. When you're really trying to hear from him on something, you're going to hear from him. He always speaks to his children. You ain't got to... He always speaks to his children. Let me just say it like that. If your child came to you, mama, I need this, mama, I need that. At some point, you're going to turn to your child. What you need, baby? Right? Because that's your baby. That's your child. Most I love you more than that. So um, we're going to do the Kahoot first. We'll do that. No points. Not a point system. Just for you to check your own knowledge. Let me see if I can log in here. And um, then we'll do the actual review after that. And you'll see. You, you'll see. Some of the stuff. I don't know how. Do I just go to the where well, everybody's got a device? But I think there's a way I can do this on here. Apps. Here we go. Found it. I can log into Kahoot right here. It might come up where you don't have to put a code in. Let's try it. How's everybody doing, by the way? Everybody good? Is this helpful? Has this been helpful so far? Great. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah, very helpful. Thank you. All right, let me see. I don't know if this. We good. We good. Logged in. All right. Levitical offering series. All right. Um. Allow. What do y'all see? This is my first time doing this on on Zoom, so. I see a Kahoot. Yeah, we see it. Okay, it we good. in a purple screen. Let's do it. All right. Um, all right, Mishpaka. Let's do classic mode and let's do a start. If this thing don't work, I'll do it the old fashioned or the other way. I know. Uh, classic mode. Start. It's gonna send an invitation to all the participants. That's the pin on your device. On your device, you shall log in. Uh, it's either the app or you can go online. There's an app for the hoop. I see a coach e. Dion in the building. Yeah, yeah, so in the building. Okay, I see it's popping up. You can either also there's a QR code on your screen if you wanted to just use that. I think you can do that as well. But give everybody some time. How do you get in it? How do you, what do you uh, go to put the code in? So I think you would either go to kahoot.com or you could download the app. It's, it's, it's in right. the chat. Just click oh, open. God. It's in the chat. Thank you. Oh, that's needed. Put a link in there. Okay. That's pretty neat. Uh, I'm going to go through some of the chat. So uh, I'm not downing the whole C for Bible family, I was just calling out one thing that I saw in there that kind of made me cautious of some stuff. So um, 
just just keep that in mind you know and while people are logging in i can go into the other part too um the apocrypha is a selection of books which were published in the original 1611 kj king james bible these apocryphal books from my understanding they used to be positioned between the old and the new testament and it also reportedly contained maps genealogies now the apocrypha was a part of the kjv for 274 years until being removed in 1885 AD. So that's not too long ago. You understand what I mean? So a portion of these books were called deuterocanonical books by some entities like the Catholic Church. Now, according to the Dead Sea Scrolls website, three works of the Apocrypha are found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Book of Sirach, the Book of Tobit, and the epistle of Jeremiah. Now, now, Jasher. Jasher is mentioned twice in the Hebrew Bible. Joshua 10, 13, and 2 Samuel 1 and 18. Now, uh, there's a possible third reference, which they say 1 Kings 8, 53, but I'm not, I'm not sure of that claim right there. Now, one key to discerning the text of the Apocrypha and Pseudepigrapha is to see where the principles and the teachings line up with what is considered canon in your mind. Um, so that's just keep you keep in mind that um, Jasher also. Let me see. Did I have this in my notes? Let me check. There is no, from my understanding, Hebrew copy of the book of Jasher that exists today. Um, when you get to digging into this, you'll also see, so the book, the word Jasher is really Yashar. Anybody know what the word means? Anybody know what the word Yashar means? Yashar, Yashar. Or the word Jasher. Anybody know what that means, right? So, mm. technically, the word means upright. Yeah. Oh, did somebody put that in the chat? I didn't see it. It did. My bad. So, technically, oh, it says device is not supported. Okay. I see some people. Yeah, righteous. So, yeah, it means the book of the upright or the righteous. So, it's talking about that's what it's saying. So, I'm not saying that the book is not valid. But what I'm saying is, is that I'm not saying the book is not valid. What I'm saying is that we we got to get all this understanding. It's good to have this understanding when we do read things. So this book is technically it's not a it's not a name, right? It's not it might not be considered a name. It might be saying, hey, this is the book of the upright. Now, reportedly, the earliest ver edition of Jasher that we have today was printed in Venice in 1625. There might be also some evidence of a 13th century edition. Again, family, like when you start digging, you're going to start seeing some things. Um, I'm not, I'm unsure of the, the validity of the current version of Jasher that we have. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm not saying it is not valid. I'm just saying I'm, I don't, I'm unsure because, right, obviously we weren't there when it was written. That, as long as we know of, that, that's what we know, we weren't there when it was written. So if I'm understanding my source correctly, there could be reportedly what they call multiple versions of Jasher or the Book of the Upright or books referred to by that name. So um, some parts may be more obscure and may be based on uh, you know, non-Yahudi sources. So I, I say you had to dig and do that stuff. You might see some minor errors, right? Like lifespans inconsistent with the Torah's account. Like it says, I think Malou, it has Methuselah living until 960 instead of 969 in the Torah. Right, you see in, in Genesis 5, let me see, what was, what was Methuselah's age? Anybody know? What does it say in Torah? How long did he live? Genesis 5. Methuselah lived 700. 900 something, right? 969. So technically he's the oldest recorded man in uh, the Bible. 
Anybody know how, how long Adam lived? Not much less than that, right? Not much less than that, no. Is it was he still lived to be 900, 900 something years old, didn't he? Nine hundred and thirty years. Okay. Anybody know how long? Uh, I'm trying to find Jared. How long Jared lived? Or Yared? Yared. Jared. 962. 962. So Yared is in six, in second place. So I'm not putting it in second. You know, I'm not, it's not a comparison of ages. I'm just, he's right under uh, Methuselah. So let me not say second place. I retract saying that. Um. Now, let me, add, let me look at, anybody know how long Sarah lived? Sarah, how long did she live? Anybody I think here? 127. Let's verify. I think you might be right, Akoti. Genesis, I want to say. Here we go. It is right around the time. Here we go. It's at the end of. Uh, I'm trying to find the actual scripture, but. But anyway, are we ready? Let me see. Let me check. Google the... says 175 years, <laughs> but that's <Really>? Google. <laughs> Let's see. Um... It's um, Genesis 23:1. There we go. Yeah. How long is that, Zahab? It's 127. 127. Mm hmm. Now it said she was how old when them when them other guys was checking for her? How old was she? And they were still checking for her. How old was she? Well, Abraham, how old was she when the when the men was looking at her? Anybody remember that? Yeah, Abraham. Wasn't she nine? Ninety seven. Ninety seven. Ninety. Mishpaka. That speaks to uh, that speaks to the way the Most High built His people. All right, we got nine people in. We're gonna rock with them nine. Everybody else, hey, we just gonna just just rock with us. It's because this is gonna be part of the review. All right, so we'll start it up. There's no points, but there's a clock involved. Right, it's twenty seconds for certain questions and thirty for others. It's about to start now. Question is, how many categories of offerings are listed in the book of Leviticus, chapters 1 through 7? Got some answers going up. One answer so far. How many categories? How many categories of offerings? Or in other words, how many offerings? Which one of these is it? So we got various ones. Now, before I skip this, please let me know y'all ain't been listening. I'm just playing. <laughs> so the correct answer is five. That would be the circle. So remember, you got which offerings? Ascending, grain, peace, sin, guilt. Five offerings. Good job, though. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. That's why we there's no points, so don't worry about getting points. This is your own knowledge check. Um, it still does a score. Oh, it's zero. Okay, yeah, zero. Should be zeros. All right, true or false question. In an ascending offering, everything was burned up except for the skin of the animal, which was given to the acting priest. Is that true? False. 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 <laughs> Oh man, this, I'm glad we did this. Now, now I'm glad we did this. Everyone said false. That is incorrect. I will show you why. She set us up. 
I was trying to, I was trying to hit true, but I was hitting on the wrong thing. <laughs> let me go. Uh, oh, it won't let me stop sharing because we're doing a cahoot. So let me let me reshare. But I was going to show y'all. Oh, I can share. I can share. Hold up. I can. I got to show y'all this. If it'll allow me. You can't see my screen, right? Yes. Yeah, there we go. Let's go to Leviticus 7. Uh, let's do seven. I got so much on my screen right now. I don't know. It's... There we go. Leviticus the seven. I think it's verse six uh, or eight. All right. First, first one. This is the Torah of the guilt. Excuse me. Here we go. Close that. All right. This is the Torah of the guilt offering is most set apart. All right, come on down. Verse nine. Oh, I'm in the wrong chapter. It's verse six, chapter six, excuse me. Ascending offering. Let's go back over here to seven. Let me do a quick word search. Here we go. <clears throat> All right. All right. The guilt offering is like the sin offering. There is one Torah for them both. The priest who makes atonement with it, it is his. And the priest who brings anyone's ascending offering, the skin of the ascending offering, which he has brought, is the priest. It is his. All right. That's all right. We know where we at. We just know where we at. That's all. We Let's, let's get back into it. So we just is just letting us know where we are. Um. You can see the screen now again. There we go. It's back. Okay. So let's keep going. Next question. Let's see. Again, there should be no scoreboard. All right, good. No score. Okay. Here we go. Quiz. Question number three. It's only 15 questions. Now, there are multiple answers for this question. What characteristics were required of animals selected from the herd or the flock for the ascending offering? Herd or flock, that's your sheep or your goat. So what were the characteristics? Now, you can, you can select more than one answer. For some reason, I can't see. Hold on. Can't see can't. my, um, how I pick. Oh. Okay. So the, yeah, it had to be perfect, perfect and it had to be a male. male. That's correct. It had to be Tamim and a male. That is correct. Um, most people, y'all got a lot of that correct. Perfect was no question. Y'all got that one. That was a giveaway. Um, Ms. Pucat, let me know if it, if it, if it's not working. I can restart it and skip to the next the question. We I, I can't see. I can only see the top two lines and just barely that for some reason. Hmm. Does, does anyone know what, I, what it is that I might be doing wrong? Let's uh, anybody see? I don't know why. It's, why it's I can I can see now once you switched over it, my screen was full. I couldn't find the um, box, but I have it back. Okay, let's try next question and see. Now this question here, true or false question. If a bull was brought as an ascending offering, the high priest slaughtered it and sprinkled the blood around the altar. Don't listen to me, Miss Booker. Mmm. This is false. Anybody know why this is false? I'm not going to look at the question and, and let me know why this is false. One person got because it. Because the, the, the person, person that brought, brought it had started. started. That is correct. Ah, you see. Could, she, could you repeat that? Well, who started it? It wasn't the high priest. It was someone else that started it, right? The male that brought it. Brought it, brought it, brought it, brought it. That's right. The man that brought it, he was the one that had to do the slaughtering. The priest didn't do that. He collected the blood. That's why I bolded, slaughtered, and sprinkled the blood. I put both of them there. Because he did one of those, but he didn't slaughter the animal. 
And that's a common misconception. Some people do think, oh, if you bring it to the priest, he's going to do it. No, you had to kill it. And you had to cut it. You had to flay it, too. And you had to skin it. He just collected the blood and kept the fire going. Let's keep going. It's just showing us where we're at. This is good. Question five. Multiple answers. For an ascending offering, which types of birds were allowed? Two types. Two types of birds were allowed. Anybody know which two types were allowed for the ascending offering? Turtle doves and pigeons. Let's see. Hey, everybody trying to go to Leviticus 1 real quick. Like, hold up, let me see. <laughs> that is correct. Turtle doves and pigeons. That is correct. I put a couple in there to throw y'all off. Quails and <laughs> quail. <laughs> We've been talking about quails today, too, so I threw y'all off with that one. All right, question six. Let's go. Quiz. Multiple answers for this one. The grain offering uncooked required which elements? What was required to be brought with the grain offering if it was uncooked? You know it could be cooked too, but if it was uncooked, what you had to bring with? Frankincense and oil. I was I was going back and forth between frankincense and honey. I was like, oh, <laughs> oh this is good. So y'all remember, right? There could be no honey or leaven on the altar. I think I just gave y'all the answer to one. Are we still keeping up with streaks? You say, all right, true or false? The person who brought the grain offering was able to take the unoffered portion back home. <laughs> Good true or false be something though. <laughs> Think about it. They were able to take this back home. Was that, is that true or false? That is, y'all got it right. False. A lot false. Of <laughs> right. They could not take it back home. Who got that? Who got the, the rest of that offering? Anybody know? If he didn't take it back home, who did who did he give it to? The priest. That's okay. correct. He gave it to the priest because the priest had no inheritance. So this was the part of these offerings they were taken care of by part of these offerings. Moray, was there ever? I can't remember. Was there an offering that they could take back home? Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. It was <laughs> tricky because when you said unoffered. That's right. That confused so, me because it was like, uh, what if they brung it that was offered? I'm figuring they had something that they didn't offer, so they could take that home. Uh, you know what? That's you know I should have I should have said unburned portion. I got you, Akoti. I should have said unburned portion. Yeah, because the burn portion was what that's the remembrance portion, right? Remember, the priest would grab the, inf the frankincense and the oil and the grain, put that on the altar. That would burn up as a sweet smelling fragrance to the Most High. So that was the uh, remembrance portion that was burned up. So I could have changed. I can change that word right there and say the unburned portion. So that whole offering that he brought, though, they left that. That was for the priest. It was a remembrance portion that was going to go on the altar. But the whole offering, you know, the rest of that offering was for the priest. This is good, though. I think this is ch showing us a lot. Now you have to type your answer on this one. You got a little bit more time on this one. The grain offering, the grain offering was burnt as a remembrance portion on the altar, could not include which two elements? I just gave y'all this answer. And I got a typo in the question. It's two answers. It could not include which two elements? The grain offering, if you burned it, if it went on that altar, what could it not include? Mm -hmm. Y'all got this. Don't overthink it. You got it. All right. Let's see who got what we got here. The correct answers are honey and leaven. Ah, nobody chose honey or leaven. I chose honey, but I don't. I didn't chose. I chose I honey chose too. Flour. Well, I don't know why I put that. <laughs> <laughs> I, said it was flour. I couldn't think of the other one. 
It's all good. It's all good. It's just showing us where we at. Where we at. Um, quiz question. One answer. The peace offering was to be from which sex of animal? Which sex of animal could the peace offering be from? Was it to be from? Hmm. Somebody, somebody got it right. The peace offering was unspe. It was a. Uh, it was male or female. Yeah. It was male or female. You could bring either one. For the peace. See, the peace offering is different, Miss Bukha. Ah, ah. It's a read. So you can bring either one for this one. So we learning. Let's keep rocking. Let's keep going. Where we at? Uh, quiz. I think is this a multi? Multi answer. Multiple answers. We're almost done. Which elements of the peace offering were burned on the altar as a sweet fragrance to Yahuwah? Now, the peace offering we know was a blood offering. So which elements, and it's multiple answers, were burned on the altar as a sweet fragrance? Uh, fat and two kidneys. <laughs> That's right. The fat of the entrails, the two kidneys with their fat, and the appendage of the liver. Liver, yes. Okay. The bones were not burned on the altar. Mm. Mishpaka. Type your answer for this one. If the peace offering was for a Thanksgiving offering, how long did the person have to eat them? If it was for Thanksgiving, how long did the offerer have to eat? How long was he given to eat? Mm. Think about it. How long? I have to guess on this one. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how to type in an answer. I guess I need uh, a class on how to use this system. <laughs> you gotta click both. into I'm the box. You gotta click in the box. Oh, you had to. Oh, you yeah. said one day you got it right. Whoever did was. So you said you had to click in the box, Sayla. Yes, you gotta click in the box and type inside the box. What box? Which box? When it comes up, it it's like how it's like a color. You just click it and just type inside of it. I don't know if you're on a PC or a phone, but on I'm, a on, PC, I'm on my laptop. Okay, yeah. yeah. So when it when it when it comes up, just click inside the box so you could type, just start typing in there. Okay, so just just on my behalf, I would have said one day. So at least would have gotten that <laughs> answer right. It might have been the only answer that I got right, but <laughs> I said until it didn't show. I said I said till morning, it didn't show. <laughs> oh, you said till morning? Yeah. I said I can I can I can accept that answer. That's cool because um I didn't put that in. I had to type in which ones were acceptable, so I could have put till the morning. But in the morning they had to burn it. They couldn't eat it. So all right. So I give you and Dion credit. <laughs> Y'all get credit for that. Well, Thank yeah, you. Three three more questions. All right. True or false? Uh uh. Both unleavened bread and leavened bread were required with the peace offering. Hmm. Mm. <laughs> I'm not laughing at y'all, by the way. That's I'm not doing that. I'm just yes, you are. Yes, no, you I'm are. not. I'm really not. <laughs> I want y'all to get all these right. Someone said false. This is true. This is the only offering where you had to bring both leavened bread and unleavened bread. Now, the unleavened bread, I'm excuse me, the leavened bread did not go on the altar. Remember, no leaven or honey could go on the altar. This was given to the priest. So, and even the unleavened bread in this case, uh, you see some unleavened bread given to the priest um, as well. So, just, just bringing this out, Ms. Bukai, just bringing this out. All right, I got two more, and these are on the sin and the guilt offering, I think. Oh, I got two more. Might be three more. Yeah, three more. True or false? If the anointed priest or the congregation of Israel sinned, 
the blood of the slaughtered bull was not taken inside the tent of appointment. It only stayed outside. Is that a true or false statement? Notice who sinned. The anointed priest, that's the high priest or the congregation. Remember, it was different hierarchies in society. That is a false statement. It was taken inside the tent only for the anointed priest and the congregation of Israel. If a ruler sinned or one of the common people sinned, their blood didn't, the blood of that animal did not go into the tent. That goes back to, I'm going to touch on this in a minute, but remember, I told you when a leader or someone in a position sins, a position of uh, clout, if you will, or importance, it affected the entire community. Remember the high priest, if he sinned, he had to take that bull outside the camp and burn it. Everybody had to go see him walk outside the camp with a wagon or some with all this bull in it. And they gonna know he did something. Either he did something or the congregation did something. That this was not so for the ruler or the common people. The blood of their animal was only dealt with outside of the tent. It did not go inside the tent and was not sprinkled uh, inside the tent. Or oh, excuse me, was not put on the, uh, the horn of the altar inside the tent. It only stayed outside. The reason that there's, there's significance in this because like I told you, if the high priest, remember the high priest in that role, he is, he is very important to the society of Israel. He is the go-between between the most high and the people. So his role was very special. Only one time a year, he could go into the Holy of Holies. And we all know what day that is, right? That's the day of atonement. When he went inside there, he was, he was going to make atonement for himself as well as for the people and some other things that he was supposed to make atonement for. Before you get to the Holy of Holies, there is a veil right there. And in front of that veil is the altar of incense. So this blood, if they sinned, was taken inside to that, to that uh, altar of incense. So, but if it was for the common people or someone else uh, or a ruler, it would only stay outside the tent. It wouldn't even go into the whole, to the tent. And I'm going to show you a diagram of the tent too. I got a, a, a pretty sweet one that might help out your understanding of this. Again, this is a review before we review. This is good because it's let me know. Two more questions, Ms. Baka. If one of the people sinned who was not a ruler, what was the sex requirement for the sin offering? This is the sin offering. So if they sinned, but they were not a ruler, they were not the congregation, they were not the high priest, what was the sexual requirement of their animal? One person. This was a female, female goat or a female lamb. That would be, and I'm not going to share my screen, but I could just tell you where it is. That would be Leviticus chapter four, scroll all the way down to the bottom and verse 27, female goat or female lamb. Got to be a female. 28 and verse 32. Got to be a female. All right. Last question. So I'm you sorry, make, what was the answer? What was the correct answer? Uh, it was a female. It had to be a female. female okay. Yes, ma'am. Now we know the congregation and the, and the leader, uh, excuse me, the high priest had to bring a bull if he sinned. The congregation, they had to bring a bull if they sinned and the elders would lay their hands on that bull, the high priest would slay it, take it outside of the camp and burn it. If a ruler sinned or a prince, I think he's called a Nasi, a prince or a ruler, he would bring a buck of the goats. That's a male. But if one of the common people sinned, they brought a female lamb or a female goat. Kochi Iwa. Quick question. Why couldn't it be either for the common person who sinned? That is a question for the most high. I have, I don't know, but okay. it's good to but see that's, that's the kind of things that make us think because we see, why does it change the, the blood? Why does the blood go in the tent for these two? 
and they had to bring a bull. But then when you get to the lower two categories or the other two categories, the ruler and the common people, why does it change? That's what I'm saying. Those are questions for the most high, but they do help us know that he is very detailed in everything he does. There's a reason that it's listed like this, Mishpaka. I, I won't say that I got all the answers, but there's a reason that it is listed like this. One day, the most we, we, that will be revealed to us. I don't want to get into uh, you know Kenny any, any kind of uh, my own leaning to my own understanding and influence your understanding. I want to make sure I understand my, myself first. Last question regarding the guilt offering. This is the last offering we talked about. How much was required to be added to the valuation? Remember, they had to they had to bring a, a certain amount of money, and there was something they had to add to it. What part they had to add to it? How much percentage was that? That's a guilt offering. This is like a restitution offering. How much did they have to add? Twenty percent. That is correct. One fifth is twenty percent. All right, Mitch McCoy. It looks like. Uh, let me stop sharing. I'm going to because uh, there's no podium, right? Because I didn't want to do no competition. Let's quit this. All right, we will quit the game. All right, good. Now, hopefully, Mish Bakai, this was helpful because this helps me see if you are retaining the information that I'm presenting. As a, as a moray, if I don't perceive you're retaining it, then I want to change up the way, as I'm led to, that I'm presenting it in order to help you retain it. So we, and it's been a while, granted, it has been a while since we talked about some of these because we have, we've been doing a Q and A for the past three. So don't knock yourself if you didn't do well on the Kahoot. No knock, we're gonna do another one, don't worry. This is a mid series summary, right? So we just in the middle, I'm gonna get it. I wanna get into some deeper stuff as the most I leads me, but this just shows you where you are. So the ascending offering, we need to get a greater understanding of that. I got one slide on each of these, and I'm going to show y'all in a minute, and we'll, and we'll go from there for the day. Um, and then, then I'll I take us live, too, so the people on Facebook can see it. But that was just a pre-review before we do the review. So now you know where you are in retaining this information. So hopefully, was it was that helpful? Did y'all like that? Yeah, definitely. Okay, okay. That was very yes. helpful. That was the first time we did a Kahoot in here. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we, I might bring in more of those when we get to certain series, because this series does have a lot of information. Granted, I, I do understand that. So I felt led to do a mid-series. We needed to do a mid-series summary, have everything in one place. Uh, Akoti Latoya, go ahead, Akoti. I was about to say, Moray, you go, when you give me a test, I need that same one. I'm going to get 100 on the next time. <laughs> <laughs> right. See, look, see, that's why I got to switch it up now. Look, I got to change this answer from C to B. You understand what I mean? Nah, I'm, you probably going to get them same questions. I got to make that edit you called out, EY, uh, because I can see how that could be. And I got a typo in there I saw as well. So I could change those names. All right. This is what we're going to do. This is going to be real quick because you already did part of the review when we went through that. So let me look in this chat. Okay, I'm glad I'm glad y'all liked it. All right. So now let me let me let the people on Facebook let me let them in real quick. And uh we just it's gonna be a real quick review and then we'll close out. Um it's this these are it's very um these offerings are very sacred. All right, um let me do this real quick. All right, here we go. What's today's day? The 6th, right? That's what they say. They say it's the new year, but it's the middle of winter. What are they talking about? <laughs> what are they talking about? <laughs> it's the middle of winter. Corey, before you start, can you tell me what is the exact date of the new year? Ooh, I hit the button already, but um, oh. I will tell you this, Akoti. I got a calendar that I've been following. I have not shared. I've been calculating dates and I've been following it and I will be at a full year at a certain point in March. Now, granted, um, here's the thing when it comes to K 
calculating the new year, right? Enoch gives us a timestamp. He says at the end of your year, you will have equal parts day, and you will have equal parts night. So from this, and if you follow the book of Enoch's calendar, the, the Qumran calendar that was found, there's 31 days in each season. Technically, there's 90 days in each season, from my understanding, but that, that 91st day at the end of three months is like a transition day, but it's included in the previous season. So it's 91. So it goes 30, 30, 31, 30, 30, 31, 30, 30, 31, all the way through 12 months. So at the end of 91 days, there's a, a transition from my understanding of the season. Now, I've I got a calendar. I haven't shared it, but I've mapped out a whole year starting back this last previous year. And I did it based on where I was. And what some people wait for is also what they call the equinox. Now, equal parts day and night is going to happen prior to your equinox. Now, Enoch does not use the term equinox. These are modern terms. He don't use that. But from my understanding, and I'm trying to get a better understanding of this, that's why some people wait after they get what they call the equilux, equal day, equal night, until the equinox when you got the luminaries lining up. So where the sun will be rising in the equinox, you can look directly, um, and I'll show you on a compass real quick. You can look directly east, which is 90 degrees on a compass, and the sun should rise straight up above you. Going into the spring, the sun is going to start to rise more and more to your left. The days are going to get longer. The nights are going to get shorter. At one point, after it goes through, and that's called the fourth gate. It goes to the fifth gate next and the sixth gate. It goes back through the sixth gate, fifth gate, goes back to the fourth gate. So that's when you have another equinox. Um, you know, you have another uh, autumnal uh, time where that period where the sun lines up directly east again. Granted, miss, please forgive me if I'm mixing up my terms. Got a lot going on uh, trying to spit out at the same time. But you will be able to see this. You can you can look at this. Now, I want to get a better understanding myself of the gates because Enoch does not technically use those terms. But he does give you a timestamp and say at the end of your year, you will have equal day, equal night. That's the last day of your year. That's the 364th day in your year. That's the last day. The next day, technically, you will be in another year. Now, some people wait. There's a four-day gap from what I think I've, I'm kind of assuming before the equinox. We have, we've been try, we're trying to figure this out. It's a lot of people got their own. When you get into the calendar, that's why you see Israel all over the place. You got people that do feasts after we do them. You got people that do feasts before we do them. You got people that follow the moon, people that follow the lunar Sabbath. You got all kinds of stuff going on in Israel. Now, this is not to knock anybody for their understanding. I, me personally, I haven't shared it with you all. I've only shared it with a few people what I'm doing. I've been keeping this calendar for the whole year. So I've been keeping double feasts. Um, just, you know, just trying to because I'm, I'm keeping it with the group and I've also been keeping it personally. So in that regard, you know, I just been doing that. Just I got to learn this calendar first. I, I, at one point, I want to have my own sundial and measure that as well, but or, or build my own. So right now I have an app that I've paid for. But it gives me a lot of information. So if you look on a compass, you see these degrees and you probably can see my screen, but it'll show you which way your compass is 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 pointing. So directly behind me is somewhere between south and east, right? Yeah, somewhere between south and east directly behind me. But if I point it directly east, which is over in that direction, that's 90 degrees. So right now, because we're still in the in the fall winter, that means the sun gonna be rising to the right of directly east. You can do this on your own time and you can you can fact check it yourself. Find direct east on your phone, and in the morning when the sun rises, or if you're in a sunny place right now, look and see how far that sun is of, of while you're looking directly east. We can see how far that sun is. It should, be, should, it should be to your right. In the summer and in the spring, it's going to start being to your left. It's amazing, though. The Most High has given us a clock in the sky. We got to figure it out. We What if what if everything went down? Y'all seen that movie, right? That oh. movie they're talking about. I'm not giving uh, I'm oh. not giving them no props, but y'all seen that movie. What if you couldn't look at your phone and tell what day or month it was and what year? and I, you, you, you didn't know what day of the week it was. You understand what I mean? So, Or what time of day it was. We got to learn how to do these things. We so dependent on technology. We all are. 
we just been groomed that way. Yeah. So no knocking on anybody. But a coach, even whenever I get fully well versed in it, I might teach on that. I plan when I get fully well versed in it, I want to teach on it. But right now I'm just I got some anecdotal things I'm kind of learning. So Okay. But yeah, you know, so I don't knock people for their understanding. I just tell where I'm at. Um so we did the Kahoot. Shabbat Shalom to everybody that came in uh, with uh, the Facebook, uh, through the Facebook uh, channel. Um, so we're going to do a quick review, and then we're going to let y'all enjoy the rest of your Sabbath. So I'm going to dive over here. And I'm going to show you some things today because I want you to really get this. That helped me know where y'all are when I, when I saw that, right? Uh, we go from here, yeah. So this is our mid-series summary. Let me change some things. Got some stuff on my screen here. Need to, um, all right. So just a perspective on the lesson. It is literally what it is. Uh, I just called it. It is a, a we're going to refresh our understanding of these Levitical offerings with a mid-series review. You should be motivated now, right? You took your test. You see where you at. Only you know your score. I don't know your score. Your team, your, your Mitch Picard don't know your score. I did it like that. I did not want it to be no competition. And he'd be like, man, why? Ox such and such, he, he got all the answers right. He cheated. Nah, you know where you are. This is between you and yourself and the most high. Uh, so it's our goal. It should be to understand these, the purpose and intent of these offerings. So we're going to be edified, right? Five Levitical offerings. That was the first question I asked, right? And I built the, the Kahoot in line with the presentation. So it's going to flow like that. There are five Levitical offerings. They are called korban, right? Korban is a gift. We know about that word. It means to draw near. When you look at the root of that word, it's karab. Korban is the actual noun. Karab is the verb, right? So it is talking about drawing near to the Most High. And this is how our ancestors learned. They had a tangible way they learned through to draw near to the Most High. The ascending offering called the Ola, the grain offering, the mincha. And it was of soleth, right? That's fine flour, right? The peace offering, the one we talked about, right? That could be male or female. The sin offering, right? You got categories in that one because you got who, it depended on who sinned. And then you got the guilt offering, also known as the trespass offering, right? So this is the one where you see some restitution. Now, all of these, there are no sacrifices for intentional, willful, defiant, purposeful sin no fat no sacrifice in Torah at all there is one uh offering where you can see a way for redemption if a person does intentionally sin we'll talk about that in a minute because the guilt offering was if a person lied to somebody they robbed someone they lied about a deposit lied about something they found or, or whatever it, you, you it gives us some categories it's some, it's a lot when you get with this. It was a lot of payback for this. Now it wasn't no just no oh go say you sorry. Mm -mm. No, nah, it's a little deeper than that. Not only did you have to take back what you stole or or lied about, you had to return it. You also had to give uh, the the twenty percent on top of that and the value of it. Bring the item back. Give them the whole amount for the item. So let's let's make it let's make it tangible, right? You stole a car oh you got caught you guilty you intentionally went over there to steal that man's car you stole his car now you got to take the car back whatever the car is worth you got to give him that you got to add 20 percent to it now you got to go to the priest you bring the priest your ram which was a male you bring him your ram and you bring the value of that ram and give it to the priest mm. So sin costs a lot, family. You understand what I mean? That was where someone did something intentionally, lied, extorted somebody. But the most I made a way for them to be redeemed. They maybe they acted out of anger. They came from a wrong place. They they, they was they had a moment, if you know what I mean. They had to go make amends though. So you see what I mean? There are principles in these offerings we can apply today. If you have wronged somebody, don't deny your sin. Confess your sin and do the best you can to make amends for your sin. Get the guilt off your plate. Now you're starting to see why, I mean, excuse me, you're starting to see the, the great significance of Yahushua HaMashiach as our offering, mm, as our high priest, 
He has given us peace with Elohim. He's our peace offering, our sin offering. He has removed the guilt from you. Mm. Doesn't mean that there are no consequences for your sin. You still have to obey, but you now have been given redemption a way back. Come on, somebody. Let me let me go ahead. So I, I'm going to get through the presentation. Let's get on through the presentation. Um, this is the tabernacle, right? We looked at this. So this is considered the tabernacle in the wilderness. Now, this is not necessarily to scale, but I want to just show you something about this. You see the direction here, north, south, east, west. There is a reason that this is built the way it is built. The gate is to what? The east. This is considered the first veil. This building right here is a wood framed building. It is the tent of appointment or the tent of meeting might be referred to as the tent of meeting. This is the actual set apart place, right? So this whole thing might be considered the tabernacle in the wilderness, but this part is the part where you see the Holy of Holies. You know, that's the third veil right there. Only one person could go behind that veil one time a year. You see right here, the altar of incense. Remember I told you when the, when the high priest sinned, or the congregation sin, they would take this blood inside the tent, put it on the altar of incense too. And they would also do uh, the ritual out here. But they that was the only people's blood that, uh, excuse me, animal's blood only went in there for them if they sinned. Not for the common people or for the rulers, the Nasi, the prince. This laver, do y'all know how important this is right here? This wash, this washing place? See, I bring this out because we, we don't understand these things. We don't really understand these things. If I showed you something in, while I got this up, I'm going to show you something right now about this labor. These, the, everything the Most High does is detailed, family. The amount of columns that you might see here. And I'm not saying this is to scale, but the way this is built, I might read it, but I just wanted to bring this out to you. I'm just showing you this. The labor is very, very important. It's, it's uh, Exodus. Uh, I guess I go to chapter 30. Should I go, Jack? Yes. Chapter 30. All right. Verse 17 says this. Yahuwah said to Moshe, you shall also make a basin of bronze with its stand of bronze for washing. You shall put it between the tent of meeting and the altar. Ain't that where it is on this diagram? Tent of meeting, altar. Right there in the middle, you have the laver, right? Um, or the, the basin of bronze for washing. And you shall put water in it with which Aaron, Aharon, and his son shall wash their hands and their feet. When they go into the tent of meeting or when they come near the altar to minister to burn a food offering to Yahuwah, they shall wash with water so that they may not die. You understand what I mean? Let me keep reading. They shall wash their hands and their feet so that they may not die. It's repeated. It shall be a statue forever to them, even to him and to his offspring throughout their generations. These are sacred protocols, family. I bring this out because we have to understand these. There's a reason for all this. It ain't for us to try to figure out the reason. And it was a good question that I think you asked, Akoti Iwa, about the uh, why does it change? I think that's a good question. That's a question only the most I can answer. He has a reason. He's Abba. He's the creator. He knows there's a reason why it changes for that person they can bring a female for their sin um but there's, there's a reason for it like we got the question right why is the period of uncleanness different for when a woman has a male or a female child these are questions for the most high right and, it, and it's not that you ask you never ask the most high question in a rebellious way you never do that you ask and inquire of the most high for understanding that's different remember he's a good father you can approach your father in the right way he, and he, he's ready to, to receive you when you come in the right way. Like we talked about, if your baby keep coming, hey, daddy, I want to, can I ask you something? Can I ask you something? At some point, you're going to turn to him, what you need, baby? And you're going to ask, you know, you're going to answer as you led to. Because, um, you know, that's your child. So we can come to the most high as his children. He readily, you know, receives us when we come correct. Let's look at this diagram right here. All right. Now, this is the actual tent, okay? Now, it's, it's a little furry, a little fuzzy, but I got this from the ESV Bible 
um, I think the, the ESV Bible did this diagram. It's an illustration in the 2008 version, I think. But look at, you see the colors? We're going to read it, family. I, I think we got to read it. I, I, well, I, I want to read it because I want you to see how this was built. It's a wood frame. And each one of these pillars, even the, 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 uh, the bars that you see in the inside that go through these loops to frame the building, because remember, when they moved, the building had to be taken apart and they would move to a different place. So I'll give you an idea. This is roughly, let me go back to this slide because I got it on here. I want to say, is it 45? Uh, let me go here. I got it over here because I, I want to I want to give you the specification so you get an idea. So the entire tent was about 45 feet long from the from this veil to the to the last veil. Uh, excuse me. The whole length was about 15, 45 feet long and the whole uh, thing was about 15 feet wide. So if you can imagine a rectangle in your backyard, uh, you know, or whatever, you know, thinking about that, it was also about 15 feet high. So about to a little bit more than the top of the, well, if a basketball goal is 10 feet, imagine two backboards and the top of that backboard, that's about how high it was. And that's, that's probably an over-exaggeration, but I'm just trying to give you an idea. So 15 feet wide, 15 feet high, 45 feet long. Okay, now the veils were made extravagantly mishpaka these colors the scarlet material that they used and even there was a massive covering that went over the entire tent i'll read it we'll read it let's keep going now <clears throat> i made this diagram right here made it last night this is the arrangement of the camp of israel around the tent Okay, around the, the tabernacle of Moshe that you see that we just looked at that diagram that we looked at on this this yellow one right here around this because this this is the courtyard once you come in the first veil this is the courtyard but around this you got the camps they all lined up now look at the numbers anybody know who these people are right here around the purple because this is the tent of meeting in the middle this is the tabernacle in the middle who is around this. The priest. That is correct. I guess it's a giveaway because I got Moshe and Aaron. I just saw. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Those are all Levites. That is correct. So these are the Levites, the Gershonites, the Merari, and the Ke the Kehathites. So you see, all these are Levites, and they were told where to camp. The Gershonites had to go west behind behind the uh, the tent, the dwelling place. They were back there. Merari on the north side, Kehathites on the uh on the south side, and you got Moshe and Aaron and his sons on the east. Outside of that was the tribes, and it went in this direction. They, who's listed first? You got Yehuda, Yisachar, Zebulon, Reuben, Shimon, Gad, Ephraim, Manasseh, Benjamin, Dan, Asher, and Naphtali on the north side. Total, not including the, the Levites in the numbers, 603,550. And these were numbered, uh, was it? Okay, I don't quote me on the age right now because the Levites was a little, their numbering is in numbers three and it's a little different. They were numbered from, I think a month old and upward. Let me go real quick. Yes. List the sons of Levi by fathers, houses and by clans, every male from a month old and upward you shall list. So that's the month old and upward up here in the green. Now, if you come over here back to this, chapter two, this is numbering the men. And let me go down here to the final number. These are all the people of Israel as listed by their father's houses. All those listed in the camps by their companies were 603,550, not including the Levites because they weren't listed, right? Among the people of Israel, they, were, they, they didn't list them. I'm trying to see what the age was. I, I want to say 20, but I don't don't quote me on 20 because I don't I'm trying to find the actual um where it was. But anyway, don't don't quote me on that. So now you see how the camp was set up. This is to give you a visual. I'm trying to give you a more of a visual, right? So if I go back here, you can see a little bit inside the tent. 
if I go back over here, you can see that this courtyard, you got the brass, the brazen altar right here as soon as you come in the gate. So if a person was to bring their offering, they come right here to this gate. There's going to be some priests at this gate. Then they're going to do what they got to do, and then they would have slaughtered this animal and things of that regard. You see what would happen. The priests dealt with this. Um, I think I had a correction I had to bring out to y'all. Yes, there is a correction I got to bring out to y'all. I put it on my notes. I told y'all previously, um, I don't know if I, I corrected it already. I don't think I did. But I said that only the Levites could touch the altar, right? Okay. Anybody remember me saying that? I think I said that. I, I'm pretty sure I did. But that said, we do see a scripture where someone else touched it. Now, they grabbed hold of the, the horns. That's Adonijah. That's David's fourth son. Remember, he also tried to take the kingship without David's approval, yet David crowned Shlomo as king. Adonijah was later ordered to be put to death. You can see 1 Kings 1 and 2. Also, Joab, he grabbed hold of the horns of the slaughter place, and he was later ordered to be put to death. Just a Selah. It seems as though they grabbed hold of the altar as a type of safe haven, yet they were later put to death. It also appears that Joab was killed there by the slaughter place. And I'm looking at my notes. I, I made that statement previously, and I want to just read Exodus 29 and 37. Exodus 29 and 37 says this, and you'll see probably why I said what I said. You shall consecrate the breast of the wave offering that is waved in the thigh of the priest portion that is contributed from the ram of ordination. Nope. That's not the right one. It's, I'm in the wrong chapter. Looks like I got put the wrong note there. Let me pull up the TS 2009. But there's a reason I said that only they could touch it. Here we go. Exodus 29. So, it looked like I put the wrong note there, but I remember I put that, um, I put that there for a reason. It might, I might got it mixed up, but I would have to go back and check that out. But I, I wanted to make that correction because you do see two other people touching it, or well, at least in these examples, but they were later, they also later lost, lost their lives. Um, I'm bringing this out, Vishpakata, to really show you the sacredness of what we read it. It's very casual sometimes, I think, how we treat it. Very casual. I mean, if I was to read about the, the, ta the, the tabernacle tent itself was magnificently designed, you know, and for, I guess what I can do before I do the quick, well, you know what? I, I close out with that. I, I come back and close out with that. We'll, we'll read about the, the tabernacle. So these are your beef cuts. We talked about this, right? Remember, the priest was commanded to eat the sin offering and the guilt offerings. Those were eaten. The peace offering, he also, uh, a man ate the peace offering and a portion was given to the priest for them to eat the breast and the right thigh, which you see circled here. Uh, and after this was all after a specified portion is given to the Most High. The Most High gets his part first. Then these other meals occur. But the Most High gets his part first. Like if a man did a peace offering, the Most High would get his portion. The priest would get what he would get. And then the man would take the rest of that flesh back. And he could have a, 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 a gathering. I don't want to liken it to a barbecue because I feel I really think that's low level to say it like that because this was an actual sacrifice. Uh, but it was a gathering. And only people who were clean could eat of that gathering. Whoever he invited, I guess. They had to be clean. Ritual, you know what I mean? Ceremony, you clean. They couldn't have touched a dead body. It couldn't be on Nida. Things like that. They had to be clean to eat it. You understand what I mean? So these are sacred protocols. Um, what I do want to show you is this. So we'll do the quick study now. The ascending offering review, and I put it all on the screen. And I got a question at the end on each one of these slides. I only got five slides on the review. Remember, it could be from the herd the flock or the birds that is chapter one it's all it's all chapter one and chapter one itself is like maybe 16 17 verses it's a very good read i recommend you take your time and read it um 
there's a little bit of repetition in there but it's also it's a very you what you're reading when you read that is a sacred protocol to draw near to the most high that's what the way you should look at it when you read it there were three ways and it, and it kind of where there was a sliding scale depending on a person's wealth right you could bring it from the herd that's a bull that's a cattle right that's a, it had to be a male you could bring it from the flock that's considered a goat or a sheep right or you could bring a bird two birds were allowed turtle doves and the pigeons only could not bring a, a bird of prey those birds were considered unclean those they were not sacrificed um so now everything was washed and it was all burned up but we remember we remember the, the priest got that skin right we talked about that earlier so we don't have to cover that again everything was burned up except the skin the priest that did it whoever was working that day as the priest he got the skin he could use that to do what make his shoes make he used wherever he wanted to it was his he got that skin so he got that leather right um remember because the other tribes they took care of the levites they didn't have an inheritance the levites couldn't work right because they did the work of the temple now, when you when we read how this temple was built, you will see every time this temple moved, what all the priests had to move. We're talking about a wood frame building that had to be deconstructed and reconstructed every time they moved. All these sacrifices of all these people, you saw all those numbers of those people in those camps. They bring in their sacrifices to this group of people to do the sacrifices. These men were constantly working, if you understand what I mean. Uh, they kept that fire burning, right? That of that altar, that fire. That, uh, they kept the fire burning. So, now the offerer. We talked about this already. He was the one that took the life of the animal, not the priest. The offerer did that, and you can understand that this was probably a very uh, emotional and very involved event for the offerer. This is an animal that he raised, and he probably named, and he had a love for. And he was giving this animal to the Most High. And it was in essence, he was drawing near to the Most High. Before he slaughtered the animal, he laid his hands on his head. Matter of fact, the word there in the Hebrew is almost like he put his weight on the animal's head because the animal supported him. So he leaned into this animal, pressed in, and this animal now represented him on that altar. It is likened to a person saying, all that I am belongs to you, Father Yahuwah question some introspective questions in regard to this this offering do we value the time that we spend with the most high do we value the things that we bring to the most high do we truly value them we remember you couldn't just bring the most high no hand-me-down or no no throwaways this is not what you dropped off at the altar you brought your best to the altar your best out of your flock your best out of your herd. You're going to bring your best bull. You understand what I mean? Not the cheap one. Not the one you're trying to keep back for yourself. Mm -mm. Not, nah, you're bringing the best. You, you ain't holding the back, best back for yourself. You're bringing it to the most high. This was a representation of how you felt about your relationship with the most high. What you brought to him. Last bullet. Are we willing to bring something to the most high that is highly valuable to us? Because we value our acceptance with him more than we value the thing, our intimacy, our closeness with him. You understand what I mean? This was the domestic, a domesticated animal. Let's keep going. The grain offering, right? Grain offering. We talked about this. The only bloodless offering that we see, right? The only bloodless offering. Uh, it could be uncooked. It could be cooked, or it could actually be the first fruits from your crop. So you could, you could draw near in three modes in this one. Now, Keep in mind that if it was uncooked, we talk about that. The offerer poured oil on it and frankincense on it, and the priest burnt what you call a remembrance portion, like a memorial portion on the altar. The rest of that grain offering went to Aharon and his sons. You understand what I mean? So when you brought this grain offering, you were giving all of this, you were giving all of this up. A remembrance portion went on the altar, the rest of the grain went to the priest. If you cooked it, had to be unleavened. Remember, you can't cook, you can't burn anything on the altar that has leaven in it. But if you cooked it, you there was oil involved with each type, and the priest would burn a remembrance portion on it of it on the altar, right? You prepared this at home in your camp. You didn't bring this, you didn't prepare it there. You brought it already prepared. The rest of the grain offering that you brought, 
After they burnt that remembrance portion, that food you cooked, it was for the priests. You didn't take you a little snack from it. You gave it all up. You understand what I mean? So when you was in that house cooking that, putting your love into that work, that bread you was making for him, however you did it, falafel style, cracker style, wafer style, however you did it, cake style, whatever, however you did it, you brought it and you was giving it all up. You was giving it all up and it was, and it was, and that was part of your devotion. Remember, you draw near to the most high. The purpose of these offerings is to draw near. And the father is making a way for everybody to draw near. We saw that in the ascending offering. If you couldn't afford a bull, you could bring a sheep or a goat. If you couldn't bring a sheep or a goat, you can bring two turtle doves, or you can bring the turtle doves or the pigeons. You understand what I mean, right? Which is which is which was considered very cheap. If you didn't have the money to do that, then what would you do, right? You would try to find, because you value your relationship with the most high so much, you you would do work or labor for someone to where you could buy one of these items and then draw near to the most high. You understand what I mean? Action shows where your faith is. Your faith is represented by your actions. Not just, man, I ain't got no dollars in my pocket, man. Well, you know, can't get no turtle the other day or no pigeons or what. No, find a way. Find a way. You, everybody got something to offer to the Most High. You got talent. You got time. You got treasure. You got something the Most High has blessed you with that you can use for him or give to him. Come on. You understand what I mean? No leaven or honey went on that altar, right? Last thing you could bring was the first fruits, right? So if you was in your crop and that that crop that crop started to come in, you started to see one bud, you snatched that one. You take you taking that one, taking it to the priest, and it actually was it called it crushed heads of grain. You bring that, put some oil and frankincense on it. That went on the uh, altar as a remembrance portion. That blessed the rest of your crop. That's the first fruits offering of your entire crop. That is like asking the Most High for His protection from storm enemies. For the rest of that crop to come in. It's like saying all that I have belongs to you, Father Yahuwah. Ascending offering like all that I am. Grain offering like all that I have. Because that's a fact, right? All that we have does belong to him. Correct? Introspective questions. Do we have the mindset that everything we have belongs to Father Yahuwah? Will we trust in Elohim to provide for us regardless of the situation? Selah. Hmm. Let's keep going. I'll give you these slides, by the way. Uh, peace offering, right? <clears throat> Some people was kind of confused on this one I perceived earlier. Male or female. That's correct. It could be either male or female. It could come from the cattle or the, uh, the flock. Offer a brought it to the priest and went through the same protocol. He leaned on it. He also slayed it. Now, the a fire offering first went to the father. Remember, you he has to get his portion first. So that was the fat and in uh the things that we talked about earlier, right? The the two kidneys and the fat that's on them and the, the appendage on the liver, right? All the fat on the entrails, all the fat. We don't eat any fat or blood. That's the everlasting law. If it was for Thanksgiving. If it was because you got you got a different two categories for a piece out, well, really three. If it was a Thanksgiving offering, you had to bring unleavened bread with it, and it was three types mentioned, and you had to bring leavened bread with it. This is a Thanksgiving offering. This is a feast you're about to have, and it's a one day feast. Because if it's a Thanksgiving offering, you got to eat it the same day. Now, if it was a vow or a free will offering. You can eat it the same day and the next day, but it was burned on the third day. You didn't eat it on the third day. So you got those two divisions. If, if it was a Thanksgiving offering, eat it the same day. Nothing in the morning. Whatever you, Whatever's left, you burn. Vow offering, if, if it was a vow offering or free offering, you got two days to eat it. Question. Introspective questions. Are we at peace with Father Yahuwah? That's a question for each person individually. Is there something hidden, excuse me, is there something hindering us from being at peace with Elohim? If we recognize that we're not at peace with him, is there something hindering us? Have we pinpointed what it is? And if we found out what it is, are we willing to correct it? Just some introspective questions, introspective questions. Let's keep going. 
Um, the next one was the guilt, uh, excuse me, the sin offering. Now, this is where we got, we had to get some, some understanding, right? Because you got some categories. I won't go through all the information, but I'm going to just, you can have this for your own time. The high priest could sin. If he sinned, he had to bring a bull. And he had to slay it before Father Yahuwah. And then he brought that, he brought that blood when he slayed it. He sprinkled it. He went into the tent. He sprinkled the, first off, before he went into the tent, he sprinkled of the blood seven times in front of the veil of the sanctuary. Then he went inside the tent and put blood upon the horns of the altar of sweet incense. That's inside the tent. Then he went back outside the tent and poured out the blood uh, at the altar of burnt offering. That's the big altar at the, at the beginning when you come in the first, uh, the door. So there's a fire offering presented. On the, on the altar, which we know what the fire offering is, right? He's presenting the, uh, the fat. And then he took the whole bull and the skin this time. Nobody got this. The skin, the head, all the flesh, the legs, inwards, everything, even the dung family. Took it outside the camp and burned it on wood with fire in a clean place. Same protocol for the congregation of Israel. Now, and it's, the elders are involved in this. And they would lay their hands on the head of the bull. So also brought a bull, same thing. You had to, they had to, the blood also went in the tent and put on the altar of the horns of the altar, sweet incense. The remaining blood was poured out at the base of the altar of burnt offering. That's back outside. So a fire offering was presented and the whole bull was burned up just like the first bull was. Now, if a ruler sinned, that's called the Nasi. That's a buck of the goats, a male. So he had to lay his hands on it. He slew it. And he slew his at the place where they slay the ascending offering. That's the way it's written uh, in the text from my understanding. So the priest took some of the blood, put it on the horns of the slaughter place of the ascending offering. That's outside. And then he will burn all the fat. For the common person, similar, except this time it had to be a, a female goat or a female lamb. Laid their hands on it, slew it where they, where they slay the ascending offering. Same place as the ruler. And uh, priest took some of the blood, and you see where that went as well. It did not go inside the tent. Now, there's another note here. If a person was where they couldn't bring a female goat or a female lamb for their sin, there were some alternatives. They had to bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons. One of them was for a sin offering. One of them was for an ascending offering. The sin offering was offered first. If they couldn't bring the birds, so this is getting way down to if a person, they don't even have access to the birds, they could bring a grain offering. Except on this grain offering, because it was for sin, no oil, no frankincense on this one. Literally, grain. The priest burned the remembrance portion on the altar, and the priest kept the rest of that grain. I talked about this before. Because now you can, when we get into the guilt offering, and we, which is the next slide, and you see this right here in the sin offering, you can see how if a priest was corrupt, sin could be big business. If you understand what I mean. Because wait till I get to the guilt offering, you're going to see what they gave to the priest. But you can see that the priest benefited in certain ways if these offerings were brought, if you understand what I mean. So you can see that a corrupted mind would have a certain way of looking at dealing with the people in regards to sin, taking advantage of them, so to speak, fleecing the people. You know what I mean? Let's keep going. Almost done. Introspective questions right here. I want to I want y'all to ask this question because this is a question for me too, not just y'all. I'm not just talking at y'all. I'm talking to myself too. Introspective question. Do we truly understand the seriousness of sin? and how it impacts our families and our communities. Man, we, we constantly as a people, we put out foolish, foolish music. Um, we, we do foolish things. We, we perpetuate a foolish type of culture that's been given to us. It's not our, it's not our culture, but we've been given this culture and we just, we just run with it. We run with it. And these other nations get their culture from us. They get their, um, culture, so to speak, and I put that in quotes from us. Um, 
but we are being fed foolishness to give them culture. Who controls the rap game, the rap industry, right? The music industry. What group of people controls that? Do we? We are talented. We're the, we're the talent. But do we control that industry? You understand what I mean? So they give you a bonus, right? And they say, hey, listen, I'll give you a million dollar signing bonus. You got to make me five albums. I heard a guy actually talking about this before. That million dollar bonus, that front, you might have to pay about eight million back. So it sound good right now. You got this million and you ain't never had nothing, but you rapping foolishness and you leading your people astray and constantly perpetuating a life away from the most high in your music. Here's a million dollars to go do that. Go have fun at it. We'll pay for the videos and everything. By the way, we need five albums out you. And we need about $8 million back. We making a million dollar investment in you. You understand what I mean? I don't want to go off on a tangent, but that makes me brings to this question. Do we truly understand the seriousness of sin? You are separated from the creator when you sin. The connection with the creator is life. Let's put let's let's put it in perspective even more, right? A sperm and an egg came together and formed a living being. You are the result of that. There's a creator who ordained and energized that process. That's who the most high is. Mm. He breathed breath in your body. He keep your heart beating at night. You ain't plug yourself next, next to your charger or your computer. No charger needed. How is that possible? <laughs> That's the, the creator we serve is unfathomable. You can't even imagine how great he is. He's beyond what we can imagine how great he is. He's beyond great. <laughs> you understand what I mean? This who we serve. But when we sin, it separates our connection from him. You don't ever want to be disconnected from the most high. Fear of him is where, every, is where our relationship with him begins. I'm not going to go over this slide here. I went over this before, but I had it on here before. This just shows you about who the guilty party person person was, the priest, the whole congregation, Israel's leaders or the common people and what they what their sin was. Excuse me. It was unintentional. And then you see the animal they brought. Who laid hands, what the, what was done with the blood and uh, the fat and the animal and the body, what was done with it. So you can go back over that in your own time. Last one is the guilt offering. Now, this one here is where we got a little confused on, but I want to show you something because I got a, a, a question on this that's different. It's a little different, right? Um, oh, the priest did have, so, so they did have certain possessions. Uh, I see the question. It was a direct question. It was asked. A question was asked about where did the priest get the bull to sacrifice since they didn't own animals, one of the tribes. So uh, people, if I'm understanding this correctly, people would gift the priests. Um, they would give them a teruma at times. Uh, the priests also, they were to receive. They got some money too. I'm, I'm gonna list, and they they could make their own. They could do. Um, so from my understanding, when they got this money, right? Uh, well, let me not let me let me say this in a different way. They could receive uh, they could receive to rumor. They could receive gifts from my understanding. Now, that's something I want to get more well versed in. But they did have certain possessions because remember, like they could use the the skin that they got and things of these regards. They would get the meat and uh, which they could take care of their families with in the grain. And so there are certain things um, that they did possess from my understanding, yet their work was involved with the temple only. Like that was what they they did, uh, the tabernacle and the work of the temple, the work of the Most High. Um, but that's a good question, Akoti, that asked me that question. Uh, where did the priests get the bull to sacrifice since they didn't own animals? Did they get it from one of the tribes? Which is quite possible. They probably were gifted some things. And that's what I'm assuming, but hopefully that is making sense. But I would have to dig into that a little bit more uh, to understand it. 
guilt offering. And this is all I'm almost done after this. And I think we're going to read about the tabernacle and we'll close out. If a person was sinned against what they call the set apart things, they were guilty. They sinned against the set apart things. They had to bring a ram as the guilt offering along with, I should have bolded this, its valuation in shekels of silver. One fifth was added to it, 20%. The priest made atonement with the ram and it was forgiven. Okay, let's keep going. Guilt for unknown, unintentional sin against the commands of Father Yahuwah. A ram was brought as the guilt offering along with its valuation in shekels of silver. So not only did you bring the ram, you also brought the money, what the ram was worth priest made atonement with the ram and it was forgiven now check this last one out here this is guilt for trespass against the father and and a person did his neighbor wrong either they lied about a deposit pledge robbery lied about what was found or extortion okay now those don't sound unintentional right those sound intentional okay look at what was required the man is to return what he took by robbery or extortion or the deposit or the lost item or all that he swore falsely about, all that he swore falsely about. And he shall repay its total value. That's an and there. That's not an or. That's an and. He shall repay its total value because he took it. Oh, you brought it back? Yeah, that's good. You're supposed to do that. Now you're supposed to pay for it. Monetary wise, it's got to hit the pocket. And he's supposed to add 20% to it. Hmm. Okay. Giving it to whoever it belonged to. So this person now, they got something took from them. They get their stuff back. They get the money for their stuff and they get 20% on top of what their stuff was worth. And after he did that, he was to bring his guilt offering, which was a ram with its valuation, meaning that he got to bring that price and give it to the priest. And the priest shall make atonement for him. Now, I say all that because I want to I want to bring something out. Do we truly understand the cost of sin? Sin tastes good for a season. It does, right? Because if sin didn't taste good, people wouldn't do it, right? If it if it, if, it, if sin didn't have any kind of pleasure in it, people wouldn't be involved in sin like that. But sin has pleasure in it for a season, right? But there's a great cost at the end of that season. And then you don't even know when that season is going to be up. When we look back over our own personal lives, man, I know me personally, I'm grateful for the Most High's hand and his covering in my foolish time, my foolish understanding, my, my naivete, so to speak. And not even my naivete, but my willful, foolish decisions and actions of sin. That's all the covering of him and the mercy of him, that he didn't leave me or take me in that state. You understand what I mean? He didn't leave me in that state and he didn't take me while I was in that state. That's mercy. That's grace. Commonly called grace. That's favor. That's the goodness of the most high right there. So he has a plan for each person on this call. We have all made mistakes. I want you to understand something. The most high, when we look at these protocols and now we, 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 we have come into the through the matrix and into this world in the time period that we've come into it. The Most High wants us to understand the importance of our relationship with him. He has gifted us atonement. We have to choose. We have to choose his atonement. We have to choose Messiah as our savior. He has gifted us atonement and we have to obey what he has instructed us to do. This keeps us in right standing with him. This keeps us under his covering. It keeps us from uh, from from being uncovered, literally, and exposed to the enemy. The Most High covers us. Mm, man, I want you to understand this because confession, when you confess and you are transparent, you level up in your prayer life. You level up in your, your life, period. Every area of your life, your thinking becomes clearer. Your vision becomes clearer. Your health becomes better. Every area of your life gets better when you get closer to the Most High. Every area of your life. 
That's the physical, the spiritual, the emotional, the mental. It all gets better when you get closer to your creator. Uh, an interesting note I want to bring out. The word for, the, there's a word in Hebrew for guilt. The word is asham. Sort of sounds like the word ashamed in English, don't it? Selah. <laughs> I just thought about That's just an interesting thing when I looked at that. Now, guilt may be looked at as having two distinct aspects, right? You got a legal guilt. You got emotional guilt. Legal guilt defined as the outcome of a legal or moral violation. Up, ah, you're guilty. Emotional guilt defined as the outcome of the conscience that Elohim has given us, right? So we feel some type of way when we do something wrong. A healthy fear of Elohim will help us to stay on the narrow path because of our love for him and our fear of disobeying or displeasing him, we stay on the correct path. We do the best we can, right? Having this fear guards us. It's good for us. If we make a mistake, man, we feel some type of way about it. We, I don't like the way I did that. Abba, I feel, you know, then you, you pray, you confess, you turn, do something different. You go the other way. You do what's right. We feel bad about sin. Now, a person with a reprobate mind or one choosing to stay in a state of sin or cognitive dissonance, they try to justify their actions. That's a cold place to be, Mishpaka. That's a very dangerous place to be. When you can sin and feel no remorse for it, you justify it. Well, it was my birthday. Uh-uh. Well, ain't nobody perfect. Uh-uh. You understand what I mean? That's a bad mindset. You don't want that mindset. You want a mindset of, hey, I fear the most high. I don't want to mess up with him. He good to me. He blessed me. He keep me. Even when I was wrong, he kept me. He ain't never let me down. And I want to please him. I, want, I always want to be in great standing with my heavenly father. He is good to me. I want to please him. I want, I want to feel the warmth of his countenance smiling on me. Man, it's a, it's a, it's a dangerous, scary place to be in that place well, you don't know if you were right standing with the most high. But he is so good and merciful that he invites you. He invites us to come into his presence. He wants us to be right. The book tells us that he would have none perish, but that all come to repentance. He wants his children to come back home. Hmm. We have to get rid of the mindset of the most high being up there with a whip. Waiting on you to mess up. And we have to look at him as he has open arms and he's waiting on us to return. He's actually trying. He's helping us return. He gives us the power to return. I know you struggle with that, my son, my daughter. I'm going to give you power over that. I'm going to help you face your fear and overcome it. You no longer fear that thing now or that person now or that situation now. I'm going to free you from the demon of fear. It's been plaguing you your whole life. Come on, somebody. Most I don't want you fearful. The only thing you're supposed to fear, the only you are only supposed to fear him. We are only supposed to fear him. Oh, yeah. Imagine that type of freedom when you get to that place. Just imagine that. See yourself there. Envision it. What the Most High is going to do is grab your hand. He helps you overcome your fear. And there are, there are many different fears, right? You know your fears, whether it's a fear of being alone, whether it's a fear of being hurt. Again, maybe you went through a relationship and it didn't work out. It went, it went left, bad left, and it scarred you. Most I don't want you to carry that burden. Give that burden to him. You are made to be, uh, we, we, we weren't made to be hermits, if you understand what I mean. So you go to your heavenly father. You understand what I mean? And he can help you overcome what you need to overcome. Hopefully I'm making sense. All right, Mr. McCoy, this is what I'm going to do. So I got so many notes, but I didn't, I didn't cover all these notes, but I'm going to stop the presentation right here. And what I'm going to do is uh, instead of reading about the consecration of the priests, um, I think I'm going to read, we'll read the temple, how they, how it was built. So you have a different type of understanding of it, how sacred it is. And then we'll close out. But I want you to know, um, and I didn't put my summary up here. Let me see. Because I do the summary. Just to give you some take key takeaways, right? Always offer our best and our best efforts to the Most High, to Abba Yahuwah. 
the animals they brought forth, right? Remember, they were, they were guilty. Um, we know this principle. We can apply it today. Whatever we bring to him, let's give him our best, our best effort and our best gifts. Messiah brings us peace with Elohim, right? So we see Messiah has given us atonement with Elohim. He's our sin offering. Um, we, when we accept him as our Messiah and Savior, he is our atoning offering, our sin offering. He redeems us to Father Yahuwah. We have peace with Elohim. He's our peace offering, right? The, and he also is, he removes our sin debt. He removes our guilt, saving us from the wrath of the Most High, right? Because I didn't mention this when we was talking about the guilt offering, but even if you didn't know something was a law, if you violate it, you're still guilty. You see that even in the court of law today. Oh, you didn't know that this was a no firearms place and they caught you in there and you got a concealed carry license. Oh, sir, this is no firearms at all. You got to get a ticket for that. You get a citation for that. Oh, you didn't see that speed limit sign back there? No worries. No worries. Here's your ticket. Have a nice day. You still broke the law, so you're still guilty. You understand what I mean? So those are earthly laws, but we, when I'm talking about the, the father's laws, this principle of being guilty, even though unintentional, even though it was unknowing, it's still a guilt debt there and it has to be cleared. So we have Messiah. Family, I, this will help you understand the role of our high priest in a greater way. We have Yahusha HaMashiach, who was without sin, who has conquered sin and death, through which we can now approach the Father through. So we can come to the Father through Messiah. He's gifted us this atonement. What we do is accept him as our atonement. We follow the teachings of him because the teachings of him are the same as the Father. He spoke not his own words. Read Messiah's words carefully. He tells you clearly. He tells us clearly. I'm not speaking my own words. Me and my Father, we won. We're on the same page. The words I'm telling you, he's giving me what to say to you. He's not making anything up new. He's not bringing a new religion. Come on, somebody. So we have peace with Elohim through Yahushua HaMashiach. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The blood is sacred, right? Blood is the life of the flesh. I did a whole talk on that not too long ago. Um, but the blood is the life of the flesh. It is for atonement. We don't eat blood. Uh, we don't tamper with our own blood. We don't do none of that. Um, that's a discussion for another day. Uh, sliding scale, everybody can draw near, and also uh, unintentional sin. There's no sacrifice for Torah in for intentional sin. That's purposefully dis defiant sin. I'm not talking about people that are struggling with something and got a demonic oppression or stronghold. That is not a crutch. I'm saying that may be perceived, it may be categorized a little differently because they are actually de dealing with a demonic entity that is influencing them in a very strong way. They need help to come out of that. Uh, and confession is better than, than the denial of sin. Whenever it's possible, we make restitution. Whenever it's possible, right? It might not be the case in all situations. The person that you have wronged, they may be deceased. They may be in a different situation now, right? Um, and what I mean by that is like they may be in a, in a situation that kind of prohibits you approaching them in, in a certain way if you did them wrong in a certain way. Pray about everything. Any type of restitution, it must be you. You need to pray about that before you do it. Don't just, why you know, just randomly do that. I said, man, I did this person wrong. I used to date and all of this, man. Let me call them up. No, such and such married now. They got you know. It's a you got to handle that the right way. So, all right. What I do want to read before we leave is we'll read about the temple, and I'll pray us out. Is that cool? Everybody good? All right. We'll cool, cool. I want y'all to see some, uh, see something in this. So let me share my screen. And I'm going to go to Leviticus, excuse me, Exodus. And I will go to 20, uh, let's go 28. And then I want some feedback from y'all. I want some feedback. Exodus 26, I'm going to put it on the screen. And I'll put it in um, TS2009. TS2009, should see it momentarily. Man, I just recognized something too. But I'm gonna I'm gonna share this. I think I got sidetracked, but I'm gonna let's share this. All right, so I read this family, and then we'll be on our way to uh closing out. This is about the the dwelling place, the temp tabernacle, and make the dwelling place with ten curtains of fine woven linen and blue and purple and scarlet material, 
make them with kerubim, the work of a skilled workman. So you saw those curtains on that, that drawing that I showed you. That, you, know, you can imagine how beautiful they, they were in real time. Make them with kerubim, right? The work of a skilled workman. The length of each curtain is 28 cubits. Somebody do the math for me on some of these. So uh, one cubit is uh, roughly just uh, 18 inches. So a foot and a half. So look how long these curtains are. Okay, you got me. Somebody can be doing the math in the background. One, so length of each curtain is 28 cubits and the width of each curtain is four cubits. All the curtains having one measure. Five curtains are joined to each other and five curtains are joined to each other. You shall make loops of blue on the edge of the end of curtain on one set and do the same on the edge of end curtain, edge of the end curtain on the second set. So on the end curtain, you put these loops on it. It says make 50 loops in the one curtain and make 50 loops on the edge of the end curtain of the second set, the loops being opposite each other. So they're going to be parallel on opposite sides of each other. You shall make 50 hooks of gold and shall join the curtains together with the hooks and dwell, the dwelling place shall be one. You shall make curtains of goat's hair for a tent over the dwelling place. So this goes over that building you see in the middle. When you see the courtyard, that building in the middle is considered the dwelling place. So this tent, that big covering is of goat's hair. It says make 11 curtains. You know how many goats it need, is needed to make this curtain? The length of each curtain is 30 cubits and the width of each curtain, four cubits, one measure to the 11 curtains. You should join the five curtains by themselves and the six curtains by themselves. This is 11, five and six is 11. You shall double over the six curtains at the front of the tent. So they're gonna hang over the front. And you shall make 50 loops on the edge of the curtain that is outermost in one set and 50 loops on the edge of the curtain on the second set. Actually, I don't, I don't think that hangs over the front. It just says double over the six curtains at the front of the tent. Verse 11, you shall make 50 bronze hooks Put the hooks into the loops, join the tent together, it shall be one in the overlapping part of the rest of the curtains of the tent. The half curtain that remains shall hang over the back of the dwelling place. So it tells you where that look, that hanging, where the hanging part goes. It goes over the back. And a cubit on one side and a cubit on the other side of what remains of the length of the curtains of the tent is to hang over the sides of the dwelling place on this side and on that side to cover it. You shall make a covering of ram skins dyed red for the tent and a covering of fine leather above that. So wait, you got the goat skins, ram skins, and you got fine leather above that. For the dwelling place, you shall make the boards of acacia wood. Now this is telling you the, the actual wood frame. It's acacia wood standing up. 10 cubits is the length of one board, 10 cubits. And a cubit and a half, the width of each board. Two tenons in each board for binding one to the other. Do the same for all the boards of the dwelling place. You shall make the boards for the dwelling place, 20 boards for the south side. Make the so 40 sockets of silver under the 20 boards, two sockets under each of the boards for its two tenons. And for the second side of the dwelling place, on the north side, 20 boards. There are 40 sockets of silver, two sockets under each of the boards. And for the extreme parts of the dwelling place westward, make six boards. Mm. Make two boards for the two back corners of the dwelling place. Now, in the back back here, this is where the Holy of Holies is. That's in the back back there. That's on the west side of the dwelling place. They are double beneath, and similarly, they are complete to the top to the one ring. So it is for both of them. They are for the two corners, and they shall be eight boards, and their sockets of silver, 16 sockets, two sockets under one board, and two sockets under the other board. Do I have any uh, construction workers on the, on the call? <laughs> And you shall make bars of acacia wood, five for the boards on the one side of the dwelling place and five bars for the boards on the other side of the dwelling place, five bars for the boards on the side of the dwelling place for the extreme parts westward. So you see how detailed this is. And with the middle bar in the midst of the boards going through from end to end, that means it's running from end to end. It's a long piece of wood. Overlay the boards with gold. Oh, now you adding gold to the boards. Overlay the boards with gold and make their rings of gold as holders for the bars and overlay the bars with gold. You shall raise up the dwelling place. That means you're going to stand it up according to its pattern, which you were shown on the mountain. You shall make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet material and fine woven linen, the work of a skilled workman made with carabine. You shall put it on the four columns of acacia wood overlaid with gold, their hooks of gold upon four sockets of silver. You shall hang the veil from the hooks and shall bring the ark of the witness there. And that's the Holy of Holies behind the veil 
and the veil shall make a separation for you between the set apart and most set apart place. You shall put the lid of atonement upon the ark of the witness in the most set apart place, and you shall set the table, that's the table of the showbread, outside the veil. And the lampstand opposite the table on the side of the dwelling place toward the south. That's the menorah. And put the table on the north side. Mm. And you shall make a covering for the door of the tent of blue and purple and scarlet material and fine woven linen made by a weaver. And you shall make for the covering five columns of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. Their hooks of gold and you shall cast five sockets of bronze for them. Mishpukah. I read that for a reason i want us to understand how sacred this is remember it's mentioned in that passage that i just read that it said the according to the pattern you were shown on the mountain so moshe was given an outline and this was a pattern that he was shown just wanted to bring that up so all praise to the most high family uh we've come to the end of today's gathering um uh, I see a coach in Sharaki. Go ahead, a coach. I see your hand. More, I just, <laughs> I just want to thank you for bringing all this from part one all the way here. And I didn't come to every single one of them, um, but I just have to be honest. I mean, the sacrifices, all that, and this that you're just now reading. I would read through it in the Bible like I would do so-and-so begot so-and-so, so-and-so begot so-and-so. You know what I mean? It was like, I did not really understand it, so I would read through it, and that was it. So um, if you could send me all your parts, <laughs> if you can email me the parts, and I'll kind of binge watch it like I used to do The Outer Limits or something, I'll binge watch it, you know, and, and take notes because... Your your enthusiasm is addictive, right? So um, so your enthusiasm has made me want to really understand it. So if you could send that to me and I'm gonna get a book just for that, and I'm going to take notes and write it and and understand all of it, because like you said, it's all holy. The way you're putting it right now, that this is so sacred, it's so holy. Um, who wouldn't want to know about it? So. Uh, Toda Rabah for this teaching. Toda Rabah. Toda Rabah, Akoti, for your encouragement on that. Um, I've, I've talked to one of my other brothers, and we don't know exactly what they might have in the Vatican over there. Um, we don't know where the, you know, the tabernacle is hidden, if, it, if it's still, you know, existing. Um, you know, I'm not saying they got it, but I'm just saying, cause I ain't even got to the garments of the priest, but that was, that was different as well. So the men had to even wash a certain way before they even put them on. Um, but yeah, it's very sacred. Um, but I appreciate you, Akoti. I, me personally, I want to know, I, I want to, there's a reason, you know, that the most High did everything the way he has outlined it. There's a reason he's outlined it that way. I, and I want to make sure I understand what it is he wants me to understand in it. So when I look back, I see all of this. I see all these details and it's like, man, because I used to read that too, a coach. like, I'm, I'm going to run through this part so I can get to the next part. But, you know, sometimes when you're looking at, you know, certain stuff, you just kind of, you might be struck or, 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 pricked to like slow down like let me look at this again and see what's going on so but yeah i'm still learning so told out for your encouragement told our robot um can i <clears throat> excuse me i just thought of something can okay so the the offerings that you're teaching us about the sin offerings and all that okay so we don't we don't do the sacrifices anymore but but um but the way you're teaching it, it's still relevant today. Um, the way they did it and why they did it and all that, is that correct? Yeah, so what I'm bringing out is uh, the principles in in these offerings. And then we're showing also how Messiah um, is is our representative in a lot of ways. That, well, he's, he's our representative, period, before the Most High. And I want us to understand like this original way that was given to our people to draw near to the Father, 
There was a reason it was outlined like it was. And I think what we do sometimes is kind of take Messiah lightly too, right? We, oh, we got, you know, Yahushua, Hamashiach. And when you understand how it was done and you understand his role, you understand truly the significance of his role as our mediator, as our savior, as our atoning offering, our peace offering. You understand what he's doing for us in a whole different way. So we don't take it flippantly, you know what I'm saying? Another thing is, I ain't got into this yet, but I want to get into this. We're going to look at the kingdom. The, the known is what's known as the millennial kingdom. It's going to be some sacrifices going on. So we're going to, uh, we're going to look at that as I'm, as I'm led to, as I'm led to. Uh, Koti uh, Latoya, I do not want to put you on the spot, but um, I noticed we didn't, we didn't do no worship today. No uh, musical worship. You got some, uh, You've been saving up for us, maybe, or you know, <laughs> maybe. <Why? a> <laughs> <laughs> you know, just to, you? if you had anything. No, you know, I, I always uh, be praising the Most High. This this is something that I enjoy to do. I enjoy praise. Hey, Hallelujah! I love to usher in His presence with with praise, and I that came to my mind before I before I prayed <laughs> us out. I'm like, man, hold up. Oh, praises. Well, you know, I can uh I like to free worship. So I don't always I don't mm -hmm. really write down much things or you know any things like that. I just kind of like just put on an instrumental and I just worship. That's just mm -hmm. kind of how I do things. That's why I said if I ever did any kind of music, then I would have to be in a place where I could just where they would allow me to usher in the presence of the most high because mm -hmm. I don't really write anything i just kind of just sing to him because he is just so wonderful and so amazing that <laughs> you just can't help it hallelujah so i look let me let me get my get my little instrument on it and i definitely uh i will okay. definitely yeah you gonna you're gonna close us out today oh, okay. out. We're, we're gonna pray after this we, we, you're closing us out so well hallelujah Toda. Hallelujah. Oh, praise to the most high. Just give Hallelujah. me a moment. Yeah, take give your time. Me, <clears throat> give me a good Hallelujah. I got one person that I really like his instrumentals. It's um, I don't know if you heard him, Kyle Love It. I don't know. If you give me the uh you can post it in the chat, yeah. He he's my my favorite person to go and listen to his instrumentals it's just like they are just so full they are so full all praises to the most high so i just play i just play one of them and just just totally. allow to, to be free I hope you can hear the instrumental. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I'll praise this. Hallelujah. Oh, Father. So that I You are my everything. I worship you with my lips. You are my everything. I worship you with my life. You are my everything. Yahuwah, you are. You are my everything. I worship you with my heart. You are my everything. You are, you are. There's no day that passes by that I don't run to your secret place to tabernacle with you. It's what I want. Oh. 
I need you, my everything. You are everything to me. Yahuwah, you are everything to me. Yahuwah, I worship you with my lips. I worship you with my life. You are my everything. Yahuwah, I cast my burdens on you. Sustain me, that's what you do. You are my everything. Yahuwah, you are my everything. You are my everything. You are. My everything, you are. Hallelujah. I worship. I worship you day and night. I worship you day and night. Order my steps. Yahuwah. I like yours. I am your sacrifice. Hallelujah, you are my end. I worship my life belongs to you. You are, you are my end. My life belongs to you. My children belong to you. My each belongs to you. My life belongs to you. You are, you are my everything. Have your way in this place. Fill the room with your train. You are everything. I worship you. With my life, I worship you. With my lips, I worship you. With my walk, you are my everything. Yahua, you are my everything. Yahua, hallelujah, you are my strength. Yahua. You are my shalom, Yahuwah. You are my finances, Yahuwah. You are my everything. Speak with your spirit. Speak in your ways. You are my everything. Yahuwah, my everything. Hallelujah. 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 You are so merciful. You are so wonderful. Great are the works of your hand. You are. So marvelous. Yes. Hallelujah. You are. Hallelujah. You are. You are my everything. You are my everything. You are my everything. You are my to you, have your way, have your way with me. Do as you please, do as you please. I'm at your altar again. Do as you please with me. Yahuwah, do as you please with me. My family, 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'll praise you to the Most High, Yahuwah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Yahuwah. Toda Rabbah, Koji. Toda Rabbah. And I go right into uh, prayer. <clears throat> Hallelujah, Yahuwah. Toda Rabbah, Abba. For your perfect love, Abba, your unfailing love, your mercy, your favor, your goodness. Toda Rabbah, Father, for your, your many chances. Toda Rabbah, for your instructions, for your gentle correction, for your loving kindness. Hallelujah, Hua. Toda Rabbah, Abba, for your concern for your children. We come before you today, Abba, we thank you for this Sabbath day. We say Toda Rabbah, Abba, for keeping us and bringing us even this far. Hmm. You know all of us, Abba, intimately better than we know us, better than we know our own selves. We ask, Abba, that you continue to lead us, Father, continue to give us your understanding, continue to light our paths, and give us the courage and strength to take the steps that you are leading us to take. We don't want to lean to our own understanding. Give us your understanding, Abba. We know your will is perfect. Your plan is perfect. You know where each one of us on this call and those that have been on this call today, you know what season of life that we are in. 
We ask, Abba, that you help us to hear your voice and hear what you are saying, Abba, in this season. Keep us in your arms. Keep us as your children, as your home. Heal us where we need it, Abba, spiritually, mentally, and physically, and make us whole, Father. Give us your completeness. So to Rabbi, for your word, Abba, let your word that went forth today take deep root in our hearts and bear much good fruit in our lives. And it's all for your esteem. We esteem your great name, our King, and our Abba. And it is in Yahushua HaMashiach's name that we pray. And as we pray in his name, Father, we lay down our wicked ways. We confess our shortcomings, our wrongdoings, and our transgressions of your standard, your instructions, your law. We repent our sins and we pray for your mercy and forgiveness. Torah Rabbi, for your loving kindness, Abba. In Yahusha, Hamashiach's name, we pray. Hallelujah, Huwa. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, Mishpaka, uh, enjoy the rest of your Shabbat, and I hope it ain't too late. I know it's, it's late where you at, Akoti Sirakia, uh, but Yahuwah you know, bless you. <laughs> it's 1132. <laughs> oh, it's, it's 1132. Okay. Eight-hour gap, okay, from where I'm at. Um, most I keep all y'all. Yahuwah bless you and guard you. Yahuwah make his face shine upon you and show favor to you. Yahuwah lift up his face upon you and give you shalom. And in the Hebrew, uh, that is Yabarechaka Yahuwah ve Yishmarecha, Yahar Yahuwah Panav Elecha Vikunecha, Yisa Yahuwah Panav Elecha ve Yasam Lecha, Shalom. Shabbat Shalom, Mishpaka. Love y'all. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. <laughs> Shabbat shalom.